Welcome back to the Inking Out Loud podcast, fantasy nerds. Today, for episode 63, we're finally starting our read of Robert Jordan and Brandon Sanderson's A Memory of Light, the final volume in The Wheel of Time. I'm your host, as usual, Rob Santos, and I'm joined, as I always am, by my co-host, Drew McCaffrey. How's it going, everybody? And unless I miss my guess, Drew, you are going to have an absolutely monstrous recap for us this week, aren't you? Uh, so, what I am planning on doing for this is not going into too much detail, because my recap, like, we, what we covered this week is chapters, well, the prologue and chapters 1 through 36 of A Memory of Light. Mm-hmm. Everything up to the last battle. And I don't know why I decided that was a good idea, but we covered... I just I just looked it up. We covered 616 pages of content. <laughs> yeah. And I... it's not just 616 pages of content. It's 616 pages of the final book when everything is going down. So I'm just going to talk about some of the broad strokes things here. Yeah. That being, all the factions are moving toward the last battle. The stage is set. The forces of the light are gathered at Marilor. The forces of the shadow are arraying their pieces. There's a final forsaken social in which Moradin tells them, look, the time for games is past. The end is now. And at Marilor, we have this long-awaited conference, the showdown between Rand and Egwene over the breaking of the seals and what Rand is, you know, going to demand of the nations. Moiraine shows up. She helps hammer out, you know, the issues. She convinces Egwene, listen, yes, the seals need to be broken. You need to be the one to break them. The dragon's piece is ironed out. The Aiel are brought into it as a police force to help avert the future that uh, Avienda and now some of the other wise ones have seen. But, as part of the deal, they need to get the Shanchan involved. So Rand goes to Ebudar, where he encounters Matt and Tuan. Rand kneels to Tuan and gets her pledge to help fight the Shadow during the last battle. From there, they split the forces of the light in four directions. Uh, one army under Iteralda will go to Shale Ghoul with Rand. One army under Agomar and Lan is consisting of the Borderlanders, and they are fighting at Tarwin's Gap. One army under Elaine and um, Bashir goes to Camelin to try to handle the disaster there. And the last army under the command of um, Gareth Brine and Egwene and the Full Might of the White Tower go to Kandor. Each of them... uh, begins their their fights and they are very much losing battles on all fronts they're just trying to hold as long as they can uh it is discovered that the four great captains are under compulsion and are purposely and subtly screwing up everything so they have to be removed from direct command the armies are falling back to marilor the sharans attack egwene and the white tower under the command of demandred and on the last front, it is the Black Tower. Taim is finally, you know, upended there. Uh, Loghain is narrowly saved from being turned. Same with Andral and Pavara. They arrive at just the right time to save Elaine and Bashir and their army outside of Kyrien uh, with a little help from Andral. Just a little help. And, and Perrin... Enters okay. Teleron Riad, plants the Dream Spike in the Pit of Doom to protect Rand as Rand gets ready to face off against the Dark One. And Rand walks into the Pit of Doom and starts to bleed. Yes. Oh, so. man. Oh, boy. Well, I'm actually amazed that you managed to get that much information into what amounted to, what, four minutes of 
recap time, four, four and a half, something like that. I was expecting that to be a lot longer because I don't know how I would have gone any other way besides making that a 10 minute recap. There is so much going on here. And I remember being kind of off put when you originally suggested that we do this, but I, d I don't think I, I raised any concerns that I was just like, well, you know what? It'll be a lot more in depth. We'll be able to go for the last battle and we'll be able to go for the, the very end following. But, oh my god, we just have so much to cover today that I feel like we're going to be missing some stuff. We're going to have to leave some stuff behind that I want to talk about, lest we turn this into a four-hour damn episode. <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll see what we can get through. Well, I have a lot this of... This is a monster. Yeah, I have a lot of style points to discuss. Well, I, don't, I shouldn't say a lot. Actually, they're few in number, but they, there's a lot to, to dig into there. So, I'll, I'll jump okay. right into the, the prologue here, to start with, and say that... This is the Talmanis that I love. I don't. I, I didn't even care who Talmanis was until this prologue, and then I was invested in the guy. Now I'll give you the chance to say your piece on on how you think Brandon ended up with Talmanis because I know you're a huge, huge fan of the guy. Um, I I don't have a problem with Talmanis. Uh, in fact, I I mostly agree with you in that I like how he was depicted in this prologue. Um. It, it helps a lot that we're in his point of view. Uh, and it helps a lot that he's not around Matt. <laughs> okay. Because he serves the purpose as a character that Tomanus serves in this prologue is very different from the kind of character he is written as by Brandon Sanderson in the previous two books. Where he's only there, basically, to play off of Matt. To, to set him up. To tee yeah. up Matt for one-liners and jokes. Yeah. That is not what Talmanis was in Robert Jordan's hands, and it is not what Talmanis is in this prologue. No. Uh, I I vividly remember when Tor released just the prologue as a yes. book. Yes, I want to talk reading about this. It and very much enjoying uh, what what happened in here with Talmanis. Uh, the the idea of the, the dread bane um, you know it, it, that he's he's kind of unlocked the secret to defeating Murdral and defeating their fear because he doesn't care about living. He's already a dead man essentially, so he can just do his thing. Mm. Um, I thought that was a really neat idea. I don't know whether that was Brandon's idea or if that was in the notes from Robert Jordan, but either way, it's awesome. Oh yeah, Talmud uh, was a badass in this scene. Oh. And I and I am glad that he was saved by Nynaeve. Uh, that you know there was this last second, you know, healing miracle. Uh, I think he deserved it. Yeah. But uh, well, no, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave that to lie right now. I will approach that again probably on our final Memory sure. of Light episode. Yeah. No. Uh, riffing off of that though, I'm glad you brought up how vividly you recall reading this prologue for the first time because I actually have a story here about my first time reading this prologue. I vividly remember it as well. It was in September of 2012. I know it was September of 2012 when this was released because that same morning at 5 a.m. I was already at the train station an hour away from my house because I was going on vacation with my brother. Uh, we we're going to a Nightwish show in Toronto and staying oh. in the big city for three or four days. Um, oh, I'm and, so... Uh, yeah, and lo and behold, at 4 a.m. when we were leaving the house, two hours before dawn, I'm sitting there on my e-reader refreshing, 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 and right when it was time to go, like, we were in the car already, by grace and banners fallen, showed up, and I downloaded it right there. The four-hour train ride from Chatham, Ontario to Toronto, Ontario was spent reading this prologue like I read it on a freaking train dude two hours it took me to read it while my brother sat there in silence and then because he's a wheel time fan too I gave it to him when I was done and then it was two hours of him reading it while I'm sitting there tapping my foot with impatience so we could talk about how epic this was it was just so cool yeah I well I just want to interject very briefly on the topic of Night Witch yeah I am remarkably jealous about I know that you show are. that you got to go to. Uh, for, you, everybody for can probably listeners. hear the shit eating grin. I know we have some my face who, right now. who are Nightwish fans. <gasps> really? um, this was the tour. Uh, this was Annette's final tour with Nightwish that Rob got to see them play. And oh, I actually also got to see them play on that tour. But I 
I live in Fort Collins, Colorado. I went to the Denver show, the infamous Denver show where Annette got sick and uh, Nightwish performed a shortened set list with Elise Ridd and Aliso White Glues from, uh, at that time, The Agonist and now Archenemy. Um, and that was the beginning of the end of Annette in Nightwish. Uh, I didn't get to see some of my favorite songs. They didn't play Slow Love Slow. They didn't play Seven Days, Seven to, the Days to the Wolves. Yeah, I they saw didn't that play one live. Last Ride of the Day. Like I, I was so excited for that for that show, and and it was it was certainly a once in a lifetime experience. I mean, it was crazy. They they played Rest Calm, which to my knowledge is yes. the only time they've ever played that song. That's the one um, song I could not wait. If you would ask me at that point, you could choose one song for Nightwish to perform. I would say <laughs> Rest Calm. And we're getting really, so yeah. off track here, but. That's yeah, yeah. I got to see on that. I think it was on that's last show. Uh, I got was, to see. It was either her last or or like it was it was one of the final couple. Yeah, and I have a video somewhere on an old hard drive of me with a flip cam pointing it down at stage, and at a, at a moment in a quiet moment during "Slow Love Slow," I think it was, or "I Want My Tears Back." I went wow, really loud, and Annette looked up and she waved at me right there in the stands oh. beside her. And I was like, yes, no, oh, I just. Ah, right, fanboy like exploded right there. I have that video somewhere. So yeah, cool. Yeah. Anyway, so back I to... never got to see Nightwish with a net. <laughs> uh... <laughs> back to a memory of life, though. Back to Brandon Sanderson yes. and Robert Jordan. This epic, epic prologue by Grace and Banners Fallen. Oh my and god! Yes, we gotta we gotta stick on the prologue because there are two two style things I want to bring up, and, mm. and one of them is the Baird scene. Okay. Um, it's thoroughly unnerving to so feel the metal squish. Going going into this book, I knew that one scene in each of the prologues was written by Robert Jordan. It had you know it was already done and, and ready to go before he died. And I read that opening Baird scene, and I was like, "Oh, sweet! Like, so this is the Robert Jordan scene? Really? They, it it felt." To me, like Robert Jordan, and Not then, and then we got to the town scene, and I was like, "Wait, this feels like Robert Jordan." Which one did he write? And as as it turns out, Robert Jordan wrote the scene with Slayer in the town, and yeah. Brandon Sanderson wrote the Baird scene. Yeah, for me, it that read it read so much like Sanderson. Really, the, the Baird scene. It was just how it started. He pinching his Baird pinching the coin in his fingers, and he, how thoroughly unnerving it is to feel the metal squish you have a character you have a single line at the very beginning of a scene performing one simple action i i don't i can't recall another time when robert jordan really kind of so kicks things off in that manner that abruptly what this what it reminded me of my initial reading uh was the robert jordan scene from the gathering storm of the farmer okay uh renald uh, you know yeah, with with Fanwar and 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 the storm coming and him like getting ready to to you know reshape his tools sure. to go fight, and it was it was the tone of the scene felt so but, similar to that that it it in my mind I was like this was totally what Robert Jordan was planning was this like progression of these scenes in the prologue with these like random one off people, you know and. And then, and so it, it blew my mind when when I then read on to the town, and I was like, "Wow, yeah, no, this feels like Robert Jordan too," and uh, and I thought that was just a mark of how well Brandon started adapting to the Wheel of Time by the time he got to a Memory of Light. Yeah, I can't be. Argued. I think there's He's, noticeable yeah. improvement in in his style for the Wheel of Time. From the Gathering Storm to Towers of Midnight to a Memory of Light, uh, it can't be argued that he definitely found his stride. That he definitely found um, his, or he, I should say, at least found the way in which he wanted to blend his voice with Robert Jordan's. By the time this book yes. came around, absolutely. Um, I will, however, disagree that the 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 opening scene feels like Robert Jordan, just because you have think about it. Like like I did say already that you have this one character doing this one simple action that's very very blunt and kicks things off right away however there's also you have to think about what's happening in this scene you have to think about the constituencies you have to think about what's happening baird is sitting there he has a long introspective scene that he thinks through he's in depth in thought as he's creating this spearhead he's chipping edges of it away and he's thinking about his life and thinking about his 
Papil, or Pappy, however he he uh, he called him. And this, if, to me, is very, very reminiscent of scenes like, for example, um, when Endral was leatherworking, and he's also very introspective and mm-hmm. thinking about his decisions. I, I mentioned this very briefly, how, uh, or very recently, I should say, I think it was just in the last episode, maybe in the one just before that, how, to me, this is a very hallmark Brandon Sanderson thing. When you have a character have this long introspective scene while they perform a very basic uh, monotonous work. For example, like I said, Andral leatherworking. Or in the Stormlight Archive, not to spoil anything, Dalinar in Shardplate carving the latrine with a hammer and stuff like that. These, to me, so, are very Hallmark Brandon Sanderson things, so I'm just surprised that you saw a lot of Robert yes Jordan. Yes and no. There. Because you know what else is a very Hallmark Robert Jordan scene? Sure. Perrin working in the forge. Okay, sure. That's very... I, I didn't think about that because it's so... It's it's very old, but you're right. You're absolutely right. It's very, very similar to what he did in Dragon Reborn, you're talking there, about... There are these scenes, um, and, and it may very well be that this is one of those... Um, this is one of those quirks as a writer that Brandon Sanderson, whether consciously or... Sure. Unconsciously adapted, was inspired, because he did grow up reading these books, and he That's became a, a writer point. because of books like The Wheel of Time. And uh, and so it, it makes sense, you know, like in a way that depending on what your mindset is when you read the scene, you could see it as like a very clearly Brandon Sanderson scene, or you could see it as a very Robert Jordan scene. Yeah, uh, I, I because consider it. that's a good. Point. Ultimately, it's a Wheel of Time scene. You know. Yeah. Like, <laughs> Perhaps he just started uh, mirroring Jordan's style, or at least incorporating Jordan's style earlier than I had previously thought. That's a, that's a damn good point to make, actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it, it's it's ridiculous. We're 16 minutes into this, and mm-hmm. we haven't even gotten out of the first scene of the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, like okay. So continuing on though, I also since we're on style here, we have these rare moments of narrative shift that we really haven't seen their type before, to the best of my memory. Like we're seeing. We've seen narrative shift between chapters. We've seen shift between scenes. But now we're getting drastic narrative shift in the middle of some scenes. And a great example of this is the moment between Rand, Moiraine, and Land. Land? Listen to me. Land. (laughs) Immediately after Rand gifts the other man with the reforged crowns of Malkir. He steps through the gateway to confront the shadow. Almost in a... like, Like, the narrative pulls back almost in a cinematic way, where we no longer have Rand, but the dragon once more, making a stand and defying the shadow. The entire perspective of the scene pulls back. Like, for us film types, we'd call it... We'd call this, like, a dolly zoom, where the camera is shifted slowly toward or away from your subject, but the, the zoom is moved in the opposite direction. So when I picture this scene, I see this perspective shift in my head, this camera physically getting closer to Rand, but zooming out, so that our our view of him still remains static, but this entire view of the background suddenly broadens, it it deepens, our field of view isn't focused on the few inches around his headspace anymore, but where he fits with the entirety of surroundings. I, I found it to be very, very risky, having such uh, a blatant yeah. shift in the middle of the scene, but I thought it was handled proficiently. I, so I think that was uh, really cool how you kind of compare that to like you know a f- cinematography yeah, like, you know, it's, style. It's a... um, you know that's not something I'm familiar with, uh, but I did notice this. Uh, you know, especially when we started talking in Towers of Midnight about these these short point of view changes intra chapter, and here it's intra scene where we're not even shifting points of view, but we're sh- we're essentially zooming out. Uh, and 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 dramatically altering the tone of scenes or starting new ones very abruptly, and uh, and I think this is one of the most uh, obvious Brandon Sanderson touches on this book because traveling is something that gets used in new ways and in more ways and more often than ever before in this book. Yes. And that I, uh, is Brandon Sanderson's choice. It, it, it was a specific, you know, decision that he made, that he gave himself, you know, the the leeway, of course, with, with Team Jordan's approval, but when he sat down to work with the one power, he wanted to work with it and explore applications of it that he always theorized about and considered 
you know, extra canonically when he was younger reading the books, thinking, oh, why don't they do this? Or what? I wonder if that could yeah. work. Or, you know, and, and here he gets to finally play in that sandbox. And he has talked about how he had to be careful with how he did it because he didn't want to completely break the established magic system and, and break the continuity of the story. He, he needed it to make sense. And so what he told himself was, I can play with it in my way only with channeling. Or, or only with uh, traveling, sorry. Oh, okay. Um, well, the gateway. And so, so in that sense, we see traveling getting used to uh, both, you know, plot effect, but also narrative effect in a lot of ways in this book, where there is not only a jumping around, which we've had since the discovery of traveling by Rand at the end of The Fires of Heaven, but in the narrative, the way the story follows traveling instances is different usually when robert jordan had his main characters opening a gateway and traveling somewhere it was the end of a scene it was the end of a chapter you you moved away and then later on you'd come back to them in their new location yeah <clears throat> here we don't do that there's an urgency to it that the speed of traveling helps hammer home there, it doesn't give you a chance to breathe when Rand opens a gateway to go attack the Shadow Spawn. You just have to dive right in with him. It's, it's one of the ways that Brandon was clever in this book, using the tools available to him to make it feel so intense, to make it feel so urgent, just and, and almost claustrophobic. And we're going to get to that mm. big time next episode with The Last Battle. But he, he really uses narrative devices and structures to drive home a sense of the finality of this book. And I think this is where um, most people, when they talk about how Brandon saved the series or, or the pace of Brandon's books is so much faster than, than what Robert Jordan did, um, it's especially in things like his point of view shifts in Towers of Midnight, and here the way he uses gateways inside scenes, where even though in, in Knife of Dreams, like we talked about, the pace is breakneck in that book. You know, like it, it hits the ground running with Galad and Valda, and, and it never really stops until the end. But it never feels overwhelming. It never feels like it's coming off the rails because it's moving so fast. But that's what it feels like in A Memory of Light. And it's because of these narrative choices that Brandon made. You know, I'm, I'm really glad that you brought up this, these, uh, this ever-increasingly creative use of gateways. Because this is something I had saved during my miscellaneous points to talk about for today. But I'm glad I can get this out of the way here and just riff off of that. Endral was not a character that I would have measured against a hill of beans until A Memory of Light. Granted, we hadn't known him for very long beforehand. <laughs> <clears throat> Pardon, but oh boy, if I come around on this character as I reread this volume, the, the the as you said, the different applications that he has for gateways and creating a character who has traveled so widely, who knows so much of the world, who gives Brandon Sanderson all these excuses to, as you said, as you uh, equated it earlier, playing in the sandbox. I love it that cutting his bonds with gateways, genius. Saving Elaine's yeah. entire army with gateways open into the heart of Dragon Mount. Genius. Yeah. Making tea with gateways using leaves yeah. and water he had back in his rooms. What an incredibly flexible and endlessly resourceful ability he has. He goes from macro to micro so seamlessly. I love it. And I said something similar, not about her talent, but about the use of a character like this, about more gaze. Uh, Megden in Knife of Dreams, actually. Channeling what seems to be an insignificant amount of the one power, but to accomplish something monumental. And Andral Genhald is the patriarch of this. He is the pin in Perrin's analogy of scissors from way back when I wanted to say it was in the Shadow Rising. The pin is the smallest part, but without them, the scissors cut no cloth. I love it. Seeing him do that was inspiring. I, and I would also like to point out that it's not just with Andral that we see this creative use of yeah, gateways. the horizontal we see gateways. Yukiri, yeah, yes, starting to to not only use the horizontal gateways to you know spy on on enemies or or to get an accurate view of the mm -hmm. landscape, but she talks about things like 
only allowing light through gateways, experimenting with uh, masking gateways from one side, yep. but not the other. You know, so being able to stand on an open gateway yep. and see through, like, or in how and how uh, uh, Nalom and the others came to Andral's rescue in in the Black Tower. Because mm-hmm. they heard Endral's voice, and it must have been a the... microscopic, yep. little tiny little gateway. It's it's cool. It's just so cool to see Ro- uh, Robert Jordan. Listen to me, Brandon Sanderson get to play around with this with gateways in particular. We saw Jordan start to play with them a little bit in Knife of Dreams with the Death Gates, uh-huh. right? Yep. But watching Brandon Sanderson take that and run with it, it was just so rewarding. It's cool, and it's got it gives you so much to to glow about in this series. It's freaking awesome. Yeah. Still though, so uh, <laughs> go, go ahead. I have um, uh, while while I've been saying a lot of you know a, a, a lot of good things about the style in this book, there are still you know a few a few issues that kind of stick in my craw. Um, sure, there there are the uh, the anachronistic uses of language and and things like that. But the one that for whatever reason just drove me up the wall mm. was with Matt. Okay. It's like every other sentence he begins with here now, here now. Oh here now, crap! Here oh now. crap! Like, okay. And and I I had never like noticed it before, but oh my gosh! Every time, like, Ye- um, <laughs> see, I haven't noticed that, but I, I'm loving that you just said that because one of my quotes for Matt later in this episode is going to be Matt going, "Rand, Rand, here now. Let's all be calm yeah. about this." I was gonna I was gonna laugh about that, but now that you mention it. Oh my god! Oh, you may yeah. have just ruined that for me, Drew. <laughs> Sorry. We'll see going forward. <laughs> yeah. No. Okay. Uh, that's fair. Um. To to balance that one with a uh, with a uh, uh, a little pitiful complaint from myself here, some of these chapter titles I'm just not down with. Your oh, neck in a cord. I mean, I I don't I don't know what precisely it is about that chapter title, but it just feels gratuitous unnecessary I, unwarranted uh, i don't know yeah there were there were a few of them that felt very on the nose oh uh, heck yes and and it makes me wonder a little bit so i know that brandon sanderson <clears throat> got approval from team jordan to use beta readers for for these books mm-hmm. um a a Hmm. Actually, I don't know if I, I can really say this. I, I'm wondering if the normal method of naming chapters in the Wheel of Time, that being Harriet named them all, uh, remained in place when Brandon started or not. Because a lot of these chapter titles don't feel feel like Harriet chapter titles that okay. we've gotten used to earlier in the series. Interesting. Interesting. Um, I hadn't been aware that Harriet was choosing the majority of them. I know she was very involved. I didn't uh, know she yeah, chose all of as, them. Yeah, as far as I know and as far as I've read, um, she me named now. the chapter titles in The Wheel of Time. Uh, well, this feels there, so much less some, like Harriet then. What the heck? The, there's some, like, like you mentioned, your neck in a cord. Uh, older more weathered oh i kind of um, like that one because it just seemed like kind of bland and lame almost but when you consider its uh, implications it sounded like a robert jordan one uh to require a boon yeah like yeah agreed so one of the things one of the trademarks of so many uh chapter titles in um in the wheel of time is that they are thematically appropriate but they're never outright descriptive mm-hmm. and these are outright descriptive. You know, like like you compare to require a boon to a chapter like a time for iron. Yeah. Or, you know, the stone stands. Like yeah, there's there's a lyricism that's this lacking. place this day. Yeah, oh. yeah. Yeah, and it, it just a lot of these don't flow quite the same way and and i really wonder if if it was just you know like you know an an end of the line thing where harriet maybe was was uh 
becoming like more direct in her choices um where she's like this isn't this isn't the book to to get meta or lyrical this is the book to to hit him with a hammer or if she didn't name the chapter titles or what like i'm i'm just really curious yeah well if anybody knows any more definitely comment let us know because i mean there's only so much that even we know especially me I, drew knows more about this than i do but it's, it's just surprising to me it's it's pretty surprising uh i don't know your neck in the cord just kind of irritates me like i said it feels gratuitous almost it feels like it was chosen for aesthetic over purpose yeah and and the two that really really stood out to me were back to back chapters 27 and 28 friendly fire and too many men it's very weird to me that you'd have like modern day idioms as wheel of time chapter titles yeah, that that almost sounds like a Brandon Sanderson quirk right there with the uh, <coughs> homicidal hat trick. <coughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know. But uh, continuing on, on with style, though. Actually, you know what? Before we continue on, I still want to say there are there are a couple chapter titles that I really enjoyed. For example, in Towers of Midnight, like mm -hmm. Near Avendasora. That oh, sounded so very, good. very. That rang so true with Robert Jordan. That one, I loved it. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I want to balance that with some with some praise there. Um, but I do want to talk about something else, kind of shift this. It's still a style point that I want to discuss. It's one of my last ones, but it's also, I think, something that will give us the most discussion out of anything I've brought to the table today. And that is the manner in which Brandon plays with the pace of things going terribly wrong. Because I, I loved this slow-burning reveal of what's happening to the great captains. We have mm -hmm. Elaine and Bashir in Chapter 13 discussing tactics and the feasibility of fighting with the city of Kyrian at their backs. And it's like, to me, it's like the, the first whiff of something particularly unpleasant on the way. Like, this is a direct mm -hmm. contrast, by the way, to the building tension. For example, in a scene that I talked about previously in The Gathering Storm, Rand meeting with Tuon, and that feeling of monumental things going wrong and tumbling out of control faster than you can respond to them. This is different. This is very, very different. This, in turn, feels more like a slow-building decay. This corruption that's already got its roots spread wide and far before they're even noticed. It's very subtle. Then we have Garth Brynn, who is slowly losing his grip and worried about his increasing mistakes. We've already had uh, Ethaniel's Swordbearer. Uh, Baldiri? Baldiri? Baldir, yeah. Yeah, he's beginning to doubt Aglomar. We have Grandal, spotted by Perrin, invading the dreams of Davram Bashir. I just love the way that Brandon plays with the pace, and particularly with the dimension of conflict. It's really, really interesting to see, and it's really, really inspiring to see as well. Yeah, and, and I think this is a good jumping off point into my last style kind of discussion, and I don't have a, a lot to say on it, just that the amount of tactics mm. uh, that play a, a major role in in the details of the plot here are are well beyond you know when when you think about how we've seen military tactics uh, handled in the past um, it's either usually like one quick scene where, where a battle plan is laid out like for instance uh with Matt in Before the Arrow. Yeah. Um, which is another vintage Harriet chapter title, by mm -hmm. the way, um, in The Fires of Heaven. Uh, but but a lot of the... A lot of the scenes with... Uh, like, Furet Kareed in Knife of Dreams, for instance, we don't get to see Matt plan out this whole campaign. We just see the other side reacting to it. And seeing the results, you know. Yeah. Uh, Kareed you know sitting down with a cup of calf over over the map and and all the red and black and white pieces and all the all the armies destroyed and then the same thing with Golgon and Surath where we don't get to see it's Ralda you know in, in some detailed manner lay out his whole campaign in in Taraban and, and Almoth plain but we see the results of it on the side of the Shanshan you know, in the uh, the prologue of Knife of Dreams, and and so here there is such a focus on what are we going to do, how are we going to do it. Let's lay out the nitty gritty plans of our entire campaign and and our our whole battle, our whole order of battle. Um, well, I mean, it's a good page filler, or I should say, page patter, and 
You know, lots of people had been waiting for it. They just didn't mean... Oh, it was so yeah. cool. I mean, it got a little much at times, but that's kind of what you expect for the last battle. Right, so I'm I'm not saying this as, like, necessarily a bad thing. I'm just no, saying no, it oh, is sorry, a remarkable right. shift yeah. uh, from, from what we've experienced early in the series and to now. And where I was getting at in this is that it is in part necessary to keep us as readers engaged and and informed so that we're not totally confused by what's happening because we're fighting against the shadow now the shadow doesn't have like some battle map room up in a palace you know with a bunch of generals around it the way the shan chan do yeah you know we we don't have <laughs> the ability to like get inside the head of some merge raw general being like oh this is going wrong on the left flank and we're getting crushed over here, yep. but but we're advanced. You're like, we have to have it because all of our point of view characters are are on the side of the light now. The only exception is Demandred, but we can't get in Demandred's head because that would spoil the Sharon surprise. You know? Yeah, no, like, we can't dismiss the like the possibility that it could have been intentionally written in some small way to be subtly exhausting, intentionally so, because as Rand said earlier in this exact book, he said, you want fighting? You're going to get fighting. You're going to get all the fighting you want, all you can stomach, and more eventually. And I think in some small way, Rand wasn't just simply talking to whomever he was talking to at that point. He was in some way talking to the reader as well. It's like, look, you've been waiting for 14 books for this. You're going to see a lot of war, and you have to be prepared for it. Like this, We have a lot to get out of the way, and you are in some small way going to be exhausted before the end of this. And you're going to be craving a break. So I, yeah. I, I, I did like how much tactics there were. It didn't feel like there was too much. It conversely didn't feel like it was lacking anything. I think it was just the appropriate amount. I should say appropriately overwhelming, which is kind of a, an oxymoron, <laughs> I guess. But No, no, it, it, it is true. This is a book that should be overwhelming. This mm -hmm. is the culmination of the most epic fantasy series ever put to pen in scale, in scope, in, in pure foundational like momentum that we've waited so long so many years so many books so many millions of words <laughs> this needs to be an overwhelming book yeah yeah and and and, and as, as we wrap up our style discussion points here i just have one more small thing that i want to point out to uh to commend and that was the bringing up some of robert jordan's background as a physicist in this equation uh -huh. of Sheol Ghoul and the time dilation that's close to the bore. This is exactly what would be happening around a real black hole, though obviously on drastically different scales. The closer you yeah, get, yeah. the exponentially slower time passes <laughs> from your perspective. Like, amateur physicist who was 22-year-old Rob just gobbled this up. I loved it. I loved it. Nice, yeah. So, yeah, that's it for me for style discussion. I can jump into our characters if you are so inclined. Let's start with Egwin. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm judging by the tone of your voice there that you have uh, a reason for wanting to get her out of the way, for lack of a better term. Yeah. yeah she do it. is so frustrating. Mm hmm. Okay, in, I'll drink to that this, one. Uh, probably beyond the things that I find like morally reprehensible that she does that we've discussed in depth earlier in our, our episodes <laughs> beyond especially the things. fires of heaven um, one of the most frustrating things about her is at the beginning of this book when she's talking about her plan to you know argue with Rand when you know she's talking to Elaine and she's like here read this letter and Elaine's like yo this is a it's a little, it's a little much. <laughs> this know? is a little spicy, and, isn't it, Egwene? And 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 yeah, and she's like, well, you know, it's the only thing that Rand will respond to. And besides, like, you know, listen, like he can't break the seals. It'll, it'll release the Dark One. And we have a long battle ahead of us, a long war ahead of us. It'll just give them too much power. Um, and besides, I am the Watcher of the Seals. They're my responsibility. And I was like, the first time I read that, I laughed out loud at that line. Because that is the biggest joke. The oh. Watcher of the Seals. How long has it been since an Amerlin even saw a seal? Yeah, okay, okay. I was hoping that's the what Amerlin the point you're making was. The Amerlin seats 
never had all of them in their possession. The, it, it, it's a hollow title. Well, yeah, that's, it was that's... something the White Tower created purely out of self-aggrandization. Like, it's a joke that she's using that title, a title that is empty and means nothing and has yeah. meant nothing for thousands of years, well, as her whole platform for yeah. why Rand needs to, like, let her make the decision. I was like, you have gotta be kidding me. Yeah, no, this is, this is something that Rand himself, what you just said, the point you just made is a point that oh. Rand himself made to her face very recently when she tells him, I'm, yeah. I'm the Watcher of the Seals. I think this was in Towers of Midnight. And he goes, yeah, in name only. You know, because he's making a damn good point. That's just a name you have. It it means yeah. nothing. At no point have you actively made this a part of your duty or any Amerlin, for that matter. Yeah. Like you don't even know where they are. Ah, uh, yeah. Right. It was. It's yeah. I won't say hypocritical, but it's it's very very remarkably unself aware. Oh yeah. Mm. Oh yeah. But this is Egwene, so. You know, it's par for the course at this point. I do, mm-hmm. how, before we continue mm-hmm. bitching about her, because I am going to bitch about her a little more, um, <clears throat> and I am going to also, also uh, commend her a little bit, I do want to first raise a toast for Egwene and Gawain, who are now married. Oh, you know? yeah. yeah? We can presume that Egwene has finally joined our list of characters who have gotten late, if you'll forgive the yeah, expression. Yeah. So, a drink to her and Gawain. Yeah, uh, we do have to be consistent with our congratulations. We do. So. We do. Just because we don't Egwene, like certain characters Gawain. doesn't mean... Congrats on the sex. Congrats, guys. They both deserved it. They both really did. They both needed it. Um, they needed it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see here. Uh, bah, bah, bah. Oh, no, actually, I have two points about Egwene left, and both are both are complimentary. Oh, I thought I was going to okay. bitch about her. Trust me, I will be bitching about her a lot more in the future. Um, I mentioned previously, though, that there was only going to be one scene where I enjoyed Egwene in this novel. I think I said that in Towers of Midnight. That scene actually hasn't come yet. But I forgot about another scene where mm. she gets my approval. There's, that's the there's scene. one scene that I really like. Yeah, Curious where she's meeting with Fortuna. No, 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 that wasn't the one I said. I mean, that scene's okay. I just get frustrated by both of them in that scene. Sure, sure. So a, a little more so with one than the other on, on in my case. But uh, yes, what's what's yeah, one are you I thinking? Two on. Yeah, two on uh, just needs to be. Two on is yeah. Ugh. And spit um, on. No, I I really enjoyed her. Finally, just getting up and leading the might of the Aes Sedai against the Shadow, and and uh, like actually using the One Power. That scene was great. You talking about the Forest Song Reel? Yeah, where where there's like all of the Aes Sedai, and they just like collectively wreck house on the Shadow. Yeah, that's not hasn't happened in this part yet, has it? Yeah, it has. You're talking about when they when she when she rallies on the oh like okay I thought you were talking about when she rallies against the Sharans and Mazrum Taim. No, no, no. The the very first scene, okay, guys, when I go into battle uh, in Kandor, they're like yeah, all yeah. on the ridge and they just yeah, and she's just whooping yeah. trollic ass or yeah, burning yeah. trollic ass. Um, yeah, okay. No, I can but, get that. But while that was a great spectacle and it's a very entertaining scene, there is still the frustration on my side sure. where. Um, it, she has this argument with uh, uh, Gareth Bryan about, like, you know, he he has this whole battle plan laid out, and she's like, no, you got to use the channelers. We've been training for 3,000 years for this. It's like, no, you haven't. <laughs> the Ashiman have been even training the green for Aja, like a year. Yeah, like, yeah. even the Green Aja, who nominally have been training, have just been proven to be woefully unprepared. Uh, like, just go listen to Ada Lorda talk about it. Like, she she has this whole internal monologue in The Gathering Storm about how they're, like, a joke. That the Battle Aja is a terrible name for them because they're a joke. Like, <laughs> Ada Lorna or uh, Ada Lias? Ada Lorna. The, was the, Ada Lorna? I thought it was Ada Lias because Ada Lias was a Ada, green as well, right? Or is she the brown? I know one of the two was brown. Ada Lias was brown and she died in the Path of Daggers. Yeah, I know, I know. I'd, I, I thought it's Ada Lorna, though. Who the hell is Ada Lorna again? She's the banner, like the the like head of the Green Aja, whatever the battle oh. general. Okay. We have a point of view from her when the Shanchen are attacking the tower in the Gathering Storm. Yeah, and okay. She's like seeing that was them Adelora. all just getting wrecked, first, and, and she's okay. like embarrassed because I thought this they're was... so unprepared for actual battle. Okay, I thought this was maybe a point that Adelias had made before she died, like maybe even as far back as in the the Great Hunt when she was talking yeah. about the fact that one of them is green and one of them is brown. Okay, no, you're, okay, you're talking about just last yeah, yeah. book Adelorna, Gathering Storm, two two books ago, the White Tower. Got you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 
Um, you should you should know better, Pat. Uh, uh, Rob, trust me. Yeah, I don't I get should. names wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, there was one recently. I don't remember what it was. Oh uh, yeah, very. I don't very remember, rarely. but I remember being <laughs> smug as hell about it, thinking, "Ha, he finally did. He pulled a Rob." Yeah, um, very. Let's rarely. see here. Um, scene has yet to come of Egwene in this novel. Oh yeah, her scene, her meeting with Fortuna, brilliant. Watching Egwene completely disarm that <sighs> smug little bitch. Yeah, I said it, bitch. So much fun. And as an aside, once again, I'm going to commend Kate Redding. Because oh. I did listen to this particular scene. And she nailed it. Particularly when Egwene gets to tell her, I plan on living centuries. Like, she hisses it. There's so much venom in that delivery by Kate Redding. In that particular line, I thought it's just, oh, it's chilling. It's very well done. Nice. nice. So, that wraps up Egwene for me, though. Uh, that... Yeah, that that's enough on 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 her. Um, okay, should we talk about Elaine, perhaps? Sure. I don't have a whole ton about Elaine. Same. I have one point. You just have okay. one. I love Elaine in this book. That's kind of my point. But I, I I do elaborate though. A memory of light, Elaine, is best Elaine. Like rescuing Amathera from the Black Aja in the Penarch's Palace, Elaine, was pretty cool. But leader of the armies of the light, watching her capital burn, ordering the destruction of Falmoran, Faldara, baiting Trollocs into the Brain Wood, Elaine, top tier. This is the Elaine that I have been waiting for for 13 books. Once the initial meeting at the Field of Marilor is over, and there's this marked change in the flavor, I suppose I'll put it, of the storytelling, we go from warm, hopeful confidence to Egwene, listen to me, to Elaine, grim under a black sky, watching her city burn. Like, this, for me, for me, personally, that was the, the true start of Tarman Gaiden, was Egwene, oh my god, I keep calling her Egwene, Elaine, <laughs> watching her city burn. I was yeah, like, oh, there man. is, um, this, this kind of ties to my major uh, Elaine point, and that is, there is, um, a, like, a re- a regal sense to her uh so much even after she you know wins the succession war and, and gains the throne of andor and then and then you know uh politicizes her way into the throne of kyrian there is still very much a sense of her being a young woman a teenager yep. sure. you know and and that she's she has uh, an Which immaturity with. to her but well, immaturity here, is irritating yeah here she she has grown into that role. She is a queen. And not only that, she's a queen of Andor. And that is a queen who is capable of leading her troops into battle. Mm -hmm. This is the queen that, that Andorans for the future are going to be telling stories about and myths about. I love it. Yeah. So, uh, I, I agree with you. I generally really enjoy elaine in this book uh Hell i still yes. like her the most in the shadow rising uh mostly because i think like some of her scenes with rand are just adorable yeah but, uh, <laughs> they're so wholesome i love them. um but yeah this is this is great elaine she's not making boneheaded decisions throwing herself into danger by herself you know <laughs> uh, she's not uh constantly relying on men's viewing at every turn like, yeah. it's just yep. she's she's smart she's self-possessed she's regal she is elaine tricond i'm going to complain not now but in the future about her speech during the last battle i will be complaining okay. about that a little bit i did not like that speech at all but <laughs> everything she does is awesome i love I love Elaine in this book. She's she's my favorite. This is my favorite Elaine. I said that already, and I will just cement that fact. I will reiterate it. This is my favorite Elaine. It's awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, who next are we talking about? My man. Uh, let's talk about Matt, because I also don't have too much okay. to say about Matt. Okay. Uh, I mean, he, he doesn't even get his first point of view. Yeah, so most of my Matt points are going to be bitching about Fortuona. But, yeah, no, definitely. Uh, yeah, uh, I was... I was very frustrated um, with his like Shan Shan chapters, but oh. I think you're supposed to be Matt. Matt is frustrated, so being in his head, we are by extension frustrated. Um, Hell yes. Uh, that said, 
I think he's like other than some certain word choices on Brandon's part, you know, this this feels more like Matt than we've gotten in a while. Uh, okay, that's all I was going to say too. Genuinely, yeah. Matt. Uh, his the way he reacts to the Sean Shan isn't overdone. It's not, uh, you know, caricaturized. Like it, it is. It is very genuinely Matt. Uh, I hate the name. I hate the new name. No tie. Yeah, I saw that, and I wanted to rip that page out of that book the first time I saw that abomination of a written yeah. word. Like it's. I get the pun. But Wait, there's a pun. Yeah, like, well, Matt's whole thing is, like, denying that he's a hero, and his name is not I. Oh, I thought it was, when you said pun, I thought you meant, like, no tie, as in no ties to bind him or nothing that can restrain him. You, oh, you, oh, could, you could probably uh, make an argument for that pun as well, yeah. Damn, not I, I hadn't considered, though. Interesting. But, I just, I don't, I mean, it's kind of cool with the KN, you got the, like, the, the, the oh, oddly Oh, see, that's pronounced. what I didn't like. That's yeah, I, it, I didn't it, like. it irritated me at first, and it does continue to irritate me when it's applied to Matt. But, objectively speaking, I think it would be a cool, like, I don't know, ancient song title, some sort of cultural, I don't know. I don't like it in Matt's, in, 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 in the subject of Matt, though. I did, it does not fit... Uh, Fortune Wanna is just being a spoiled little child, and it it is so in large part emblematic <laughs> of why she frustrates me. Yeah, uh, uh, by extension from Matt Tuan, this is like my least favorite Tuan in in this book. Uh, like I liked her up through Knife of Dreams. Sure, I I liked now, her up through Knife of Dreams, I'm even like, a little bit ugh. in the Gathering Storm. I, she was like, oh, all right, she's not too bad in the Gathering Storm. She's at least competent. You know? I, I did express frustration with her decision in The Gathering Storm where she's like, the Dragon Reborn is too dangerous, so let's go attack the White Tower. Yeah. Oh, no, I remember you like, definitely... Yeah. <laughs> it, but, yeah. Uh, but yeah, yeah. With, with Matt, though... Well, in it's... her mind, the White Tower and the Dragon Reborn are, are intertwined. They're very involved with one another, and they're, I don't know, both both rivals. She, she considers them more of a threat when they are apparently working together. She doesn't have the context to know how much Randolph Thor and the White Tower hate one another. I, it, right. it kind of makes a little sense to me. It's still not yeah. the wisest thing she could have done. And I am going to complete, continue to bitch about her. Um, but uh, before I do that, though, I still want to talk a little bit about Matt. I briefly complained. It wasn't a complaint. It was more like a meh about the chapter title, Your Neck in Accord. But on that same subject, this happens to be, as you said, Drew... What I think is Sanderson's peak with Matt. The Matt hmm. that we get sneaking into the Terrison, Terrison Palace? Yeah, Terrison Palace. For some reason, I yeah. thought it was a Panarch's yeah. Palace again. Uh, <clears throat> feels a great deal like the Matt who is sneaking into the Palace Gardens in Camelin to deliver mm-hmm. Elaine's letter to Morgays. I liked it. I had no problem that I can remember, at least, with Matt in this scene. Though, admittedly, I haven't actually read this scene word for word in about six months, at least. But I liked I liked Matt in this scene. You were right. It's, it does feel more like Robert Jordan's Matt than at any other point, arguably, in the series. Mm-hmm. Or in Sanderson's yeah, and, trilogy. And as say. far as I know, all of the Matt in this book is is branded. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I'd be surprised I mean, if it wasn't. I'm not, like, 100% certain of that, but I'm pretty sure it's all, yeah. it's all branded. Yeah. So. But continuing my bitching about Fortuona, though, I wrote three times, I hate Ugh. Fortuona, I hate Fortuona, and then in all caps, I hate Fortuona. She makes his scenes almost unbearable. Mm. Um, when she learns, for example, probably the one thing she did that pisses me off more than anything else, maybe in the entire series, uh, as who she is, at least, when she learns what Min can do, and she just goes, yeah. oh, okay, well, you're mine now. I yep. own you. Like, Oops. Oh, oh, I just spilled my drink. Fresca oh, all no. over my mouse. I got Fresca all over my mouse. Great. Anyway, I'll leave that there oh, for now. I'll just turn sticky. it upside down. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Um, let's see here. Where was I? Uh, oh, but Min is a free person. But then Fortuona would be even more confused. Like, free? P- people that are free? Like, those two ideas don't really make sense in her head when you put them together. What nonsense. Yeah. But she's yeah. the Dragon Reborns woman, you lunatic. And for Fortuona, it's like, uh, did I stutter? She's mine. It's like it's it's so infuriating how she just applies her entitlement to own every human being she comes across in such an instinctive and impetuous way as soon as she meets men. It's like God. Yeah. 
Yeah, Somebody that was bring very, very frustrating. Down a and like, peg or two. I don't like. Or yeah, 15. I'm on record as saying I don't particularly love Min. Like, I, I could oh, sure. kind of do without her. You character. have said that, yeah. I do think there are some really interesting places to potentially go with Min as a a doom seer, you know, as a truth speaker for for. Oh Tony. yeah, but robbing her of the ability to choose whether to do that is like inhuman. You know, it's it's ridiculous. And I do and like how just, much. Hmm backbone that min, that min does show her though it's just like, yeah yeah i again i get i i'm pretty sure we've already passed this point in the in uh in this part of the read but when she straight up tells fortuana like look if you're going to be executing people on what i'm telling you then i'm just not going to tell you things you are <laughs> you can only know what i'm willing to tell you so and she just she grits her teeth and tells her straight up like that is something that's very essential Min Farshaw to me. So I like how Brandon handled that. And I, yeah. it is very, very interesting to see how the Sean Chan would react to somebody with her particular abilities. A culture that is so centered around omens and prophecy. It's, it's, it's a cool little thing to see. Yeah, and I loved that revelation of, you know, the connection between the Sean Chan omens and yeah. Min's viewings. That there is a root of truth in the omens for the Shan Chan. It's just they're applying those images and those, you know, happenings incorrectly. Mm. And that, in some cases, somewhere they can along interpret the line, they've lost can. the uh, they've lost the connection to like all of these omens that we have that have been passed down generations upon generations are like true interpretations, but only true interpretations of viewings that doomseers get it's not like oh i see eight ants walking down the path that means you know uh my cousin is gonna have eight children it means that if a doomseer like min sees eight ants walking down a path in a viewing around your head you're gonna have eight children like you know yeah. it's it's like it, it's one of these again situations where memory fades to legend yep, legend it's, fades to myth you know it's it, one of those deep world building connections that you can draw much later in the series for example a lot like the snakes and the foxes yes you know? exactly exactly uh, it's so it is pretty cool so, and, and like i like i just briefly mentioned it's also pretty cool to consider that there are some things that fortuona might be able to piece together about min's viewings that even min wouldn't know how to translate oh yeah yeah that's pretty cool Absolutely. to consider that mm -hmm. um but uh, where the heck were we? We're, we're, we're still on, on we Matt and Fortuna, about, right? Yeah, I mean, oh. I'm I'm through all of my points, so. Yeah, I just have one more and just a little hat moment. And it was, huh, Garth Brynn is a dark friend. Dramatic irony, anyone? Oh, oh, geez, that was, I remember reading that the first time and just being like, what? <laughs> Actually, I think it was, I think it was with Bashir. It was when I, I realized what was going on with Bashir, and I was like, no way. What, what You mean like, like Bashir being a dark friend, or the, you know, like yeah, onto them being compelled in the first place? That, that he was a dark friend. And it's like impossible, and thinking, right? Like, yeah, I remember thinking, I was like, did that knife that he threw at Rand all the way back at the beginning of Lord of Chaos... Was that yes! actually him you, trying to kill Rand? You will remember in The Lord of <laughs> Chaos in part one when I expressed confusion as to why everybody was just suddenly so effing cool with Davram Bashir after he attempted to kill Randall Thor for all for all appearances. And and then as I said in that episode, I said, and later, during the last battle, something happens that makes me go, Of course, how did everybody not see this coming? This was that moment. This was yeah, that moment then, when he starts e e arguing with Tamal Thor, and he's red in the face, and he's completely irrational. He's arguing with Elaine, and she realizes, oh my god, he has led us into a purposeful, purposeful defeat. I was like, yeah. I just felt validated. I was like, I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. Then, I knew it. And then it turns out, I didn't know it. Nope. I didn't, I <laughs> yeah. didn't know it. <laughs> yeah. I, I was so relieved when, that, when the revelation of compulsion came out. I was, I was relieved like, too. I was like, no way are so many of the great captains dark friends. Yeah. No way. Like, Just because sucks. I felt vindicated in that moment, wrongfully so, I felt vindicated, but it doesn't mean that I was happy to see it. Because by that point, I was very much invested in the character of Davram Bashir. 
and I did yeah. not want him to turn out to be a dark friend. So I was still relieved that it wasn't, but I still doesn't erase that first moment of I knew it, I knew it that I had mm-hmm. way back mm-hmm. in the day. So that's it for me on uh, on Matt for this book. I'll have more on him in the next two parts uh, for this book for this episode. Okay, so I think we pretty much have Perrin left. Perrin and Rand, surely Rand, right? Well, yeah, I, I'm assuming we're leaving Rand for the last, so I was saying, like, before... Oh, okay, you know. gotcha. You mean, like, before we get to Rand. Okay, yeah, yeah. no. Uh, more Perrin and Gaul. I love this. I've been missing this bromance since the Shadow Rising. And I said it on the episodes there with Jared and Peter. I'll say it again. Every man so, needs a Gaul in his life. I don't love... I don't <gasps> love Gaul going into Teleron Riyad with Perrin. Why? It was... This is one thing that, like, I, I'm not going to call it a plot hole, but the, like, Gaul should have died, like, right away going into Teleron Riyadh. There, like, there's, it doesn't make sense that he would have survived. Unless you consider that Perrin is Taviran and he needs somebody to protect him. I don't know. I, I know I'm reaching. I know I'm reaching at that yeah. point. And you make a good point. I mean, with like, his inexperience... I, I like yeah. Gaul, and I, I I love how loyal he is, and and the the bond that he's grown with Perrin. But it doesn't make sense to me that that it played out the way it did with Gaul going into Teleron Riyadh with Perrin. Hmm. Kind of kind of so. harkens to me a lot. Uh, like for example, this is completely off of the off of the the topic here, but something that happens similar to that in Dragon Ball Z, where there is a benchmark of strength known as Super Saiyan, which is awe-inspiring when it's finally achieved. But then by the end of the series, it's kind of paltry. It's kind of, like, meaningless. It's like, oh, but we have this Super Saiyan and that Super Saiyan and this Super Saiyan. Is that kind of, like, it just feels a little cheaper? Is that kind of the point you're making with with Gaul there? Just having Gaul being able to instinctively enter the dream and then immediately pick it up just kind of feels like it cheapens our journey up until this point? Uh, To an extent, yes. And I also think that, like, just playing even with how much he's demonstrated to, like, pick up, he still should have died. Like, like Especially against the Red the, Even the wise ones are talking about how, like, we're not going to go into the dream anymore. It's too dangerous. Yep. And then oh, Gaul, like, a guy who's never experienced this before, can just, like, oh, yeah, stroll in and, and hang I around don't think, and, like... I don't think that's quite but, fair, because the wise ones are just being prevented. They're just avoiding the danger that they think might be in there. But, first off... Perrin is Gaul's homie. Like he is going to be there with him to the end if he has to die. That's part of what, 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 what he is as, oh, as sure, a friend. Sure. But on top of that, I mean, the wise ones are just going in, are just avoiding the the dream on the chance that it gets too dangerous. They don't know for a fact that it's going to kill them if they mm, enter it. No, they in that conversation with Egwene where they tell her they're like, look, it's getting too dangerous. Like this is not a good idea anymore. Yeah. Well, um, I think it's because like, of what's at stake, the the small chance of dying yeah. in the flesh. Maybe. Oh no, wait, no, like, that wouldn't make like, sense. I'm not, they can't enter I'm not the flesh. saying that it doesn't make sense for Gaul to want to go in with Perrin. I'm saying it doesn't make sense that Gaul survives as long as he does. Okay, fair enough. Well, you also have to take into consideration time dilation. Remember? I mean, when Perrin no, leaves him for what seems to be a day or two, died like the first time he encountered a danger oh, okay. in Teleron Riyad, he should have died. <laughs> Uh, like, maybe, maybe, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I just wish like Perrin's maybe not there, hand holding him the entire time. Like, yeah, this. Th- I wish there was a reason that Gaul had any excuse to be proficient in any way with the world of dreams. Yeah, like when it took Perrin, you know, how many years of working in the world of dreams and being personally trained by Hopper. To get to this point, and then Gaul can just be like, "Okay, yeah, I get the theory. Cool." Like, well, he hasn't been training with Hopper for that long. He's only been parents only been training with Hopper for a few weeks at this point. Yeah, but he had to be trained by Hopper to get there, right? And he's Perrin, far, Perrin far Perrin more proficient than Gaul is. Far. Perrin more. didn't go like set up a training regimen and handhold Gaul for for weeks. No, because if he had, him, then like, I would assume Gaul would be able yeah. to match Perrin, or not match Perrin, but who? who no. Gaul would have been whooping ass if Perrin had personally trained him in the way that Hopper trained Perrin. But yeah, you th- you're thinking that maybe it's just a little too point. much, a little too much skill. Just it is definitely a little less would have been more appropriate. Okay, yeah. okay, that's fair. I don't necessarily agree with that, but I absolutely cannot find a way to disagree with that. So, so all right, uh, but with Perrin, less on the side of Gaul, more on yeah, the side yeah, of Perrin. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, huge um, tangent about Gaul there. 
I I love the continuation of uh, his enmity with Slayer. Uh, uh, it's yeah. it 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 makes a lot of sense to me that Perrin, you know, like he he served his role in the real world. He got his all of these disparate forces together. He, you know, he was the sort of the backbone of the the infrastructure of Rand's, you know, armies at this point. And now, Perrin's not a commander. He doesn't have a personal stake in in the last battle anymore. And Perrin's storyline has always been a deeply personal one. So now we need him to have his personal final conflict and that is of course with Isam with Slayer. Yeah, but his personal final conflict happens and then it then he's he's injured and then it happens and then he has to retreat and then it happens again and it's like every time every single time in this book he goes to face Slayer, he's going to face him for the last time. But it's not I mean, because he does again after that. It's like I don't know, I just it lost its meaning to me a little bit after well, well, so many encounters. See, it doesn't to me because it, the the point of it to me wasn't like, oh, I'm going to face him this one time and then it's all over. It's, I'm going to face him until he's dead. Yeah, but I think like, more Perrin than once... has to do that. More than once, the, the idea of this being the final one happens. And then it doesn't. And the next one turns out, well, this is going to be it. And then it doesn't. It just I kept expecting Slayer to finally get what he deserves. And I kept getting robbed of that until the very end of this book. I mean, think about all the well, encounters well, yeah, he had with Slayer in Towers of Midnight. It. Perrin, Perrin can't have his, like, personal climax happen with 800 pages left in the book. Oh, no, like, I'm not saying he should have. But <laughs> I just don't like how many times he fought. Like, I, maybe he should have avoided Slayer until that last showdown or something like that. I just, I hated how many <laughs> times he faced Slayer before he won. It was, like, five times. If you don't, Even if you're not even counting the Shadow Rising. I'm just talking about Towers of Midnight and... A memory of light. He faces Slayer like four times. It's like, okay, which time is he eventually going to win? It got I didn't annoying to me. That. <laughs> yeah, I didn't think he would. And a lot of uh, Perrin fans probably found it really enjoyable because, I mean, let's be real. Reading these action sequences is awesome. Yeah, speaking it of is Dragon so, Ball Z, it's got to be so much like fun to write. This is literally a Dragon Ball Z fight. <laughs> yeah, it's got to be so much fun to write these. So I'm not surprised that they are that they happened as many times as they did. But after like the third time he loses to Slayer, I was like, oh my god, at what point are we gonna get past this? I got sick <laughs> of it myself. Um, but okay. Perrin, his speech to his men before entering the world of dreams in the flesh, I love that speech. And I wrote mm-hmm. down, we finally, we get a great speech from Perrin and we get one from Brandon. And this is not to say that Brandon Sanderson can't write a good speech, but Perrin hasn't had much motivation or even reason in his eyes to try and inspire his men with words rather than actions. Because he has obviously demonstrated his willingness to, de- to inspire with action. But this time he does it with words. We will tell our children that how we stood shoulder to shoulder and there was just no room for the shadow to squeeze through. I'm paraphrasing, obviously, because it's a royal pain in the ass to transcribe from audiobook, let me tell you. <laughs> um, but that speech, despite being incredibly inspirational, still retains everything of Perrin's simple, direct honesty. And the line that ends this scene, where he raises his hammer for their cheers, not because he deserved it, but because they did. I am telling you, I've been getting incredibly sick, for example, of these YouTube ads for these master classes with different artists and whatnot. I'm being <laughs> waterboarded by those ads at this point. But they should seriously consider giving Brandon Sanderson a master class of his own with how to end a scene. Like, hmm. wow, what, what an amazing ending to that scene. I love that last line, not because he deserved it, but because they did. So yeah. much power. So that, that 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 line moved me so much. Yeah, it's it's a it's really really well done, and it is one of those things that Brandon has uh, he has explored a lot in not just in his Wheel of Time writings with Parent, but in other books by him. Oh, for sure. In, in like this this sense of like what does it mean to be a leader and how to be a leader and 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 how to properly engage with those who follow you. So it, it makes sense that he understood Perrin so well because that is the core of Perrin's, you know, uh, uh, character arc is becoming a proper leader. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, and and the realization that doing these things, coming to power, is not always a selfish action, and it can in fact be a very selfish, uh, selfish, <laughs> <laughs> selfless action to rise to power and take power and inspire others. It can be selfless, and this is something that parent is finally understanding, and it's so rewarding to see. It's awesome. And finally, yeah. my last point for Perrin, big moment for him though, figures out, finally figures out how to step in and out of the dream in the flesh. Fine. Mm -hmm. I've been at the very, very end of this part that we were reading for today, but um, it's it's definitely welcome. Long time coming. Yeah, yeah. It's it's that final step he needs yeah. to to be able to stand against Slayer on equal ground. Yeah, and, and just think about that. People in in the real world now, not just in the world of dreams, but in the real world are going to be able to witness some of these Dragon Ball Z-esque fights. He's not going to be able oh, to yeah. warp the world around himself like he can in Teleron Riyadh, but he's definitely doing that whole shift, 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 shift as they're appearing in random other places and like striking at each other once and then shifting again. Ah, oh, man, mm -hmm. it's gonna, he's so cool. That, that, the 11-year-old boy inside of me is just like, Bouncing in his seat right now. <laughs> yeah, it's great. So that's uh, it for my, Perrin for me. Uh, my last one is uh, Perrin and Lanfear. Perrin and oh. Sylvain. Yeah, that's uh, Perrin so, and Mjern. Perrin and Mjern. I kind of like that. What, what, like, what is with that? I don't. I never saw this coming. I don't like it. It makes me feel weird. I want it to go away. Um, so it has its roots all the way back in the Dragon Reborn. Sure, I, I get when, that. Yeah, you know when Lanfear encounters she she's. Moon she's Hunter. lost track of Rand, so she's going after Matt and Perrin. But she has, you know, an immediate interest in Perrin there because she's like, oh, you're wolf brother. Like, you, you can inhabit this place. You know, like, she recognizes what's going on with Perrin there. And Lanfear being the jealous type, who's like, the world of dreams is my domain... <laughs> Of course she would single out Perrin and try to manipulate him in uh, in an effort to achieve her now very single-minded goal. Sure, at yeah. At this point. It, it makes sense of, like, why she chose to do that. I just... Mm. And I was fascinated I like by it. these scenes the first time I read it. I was, like, uh, the the twist, which I, I won't, like, you know, talk about quite yet, um, I didn't see it coming. Uh, I I was very engaged with the interpersonal aspect was that a pun? of like Perrin and uh, uh, Perrin and Lanfear like getting to know each other a little bit, you know, where he's like accusing her of you know being prideful and she and she like kind of opens up to him in a, in an angry way, of course, because that's this is Sindane we're talking about, uh, but. <laughs> But I, I was really invested in their occasional conversations in the world of dreams here. Like, it was fun to me. Now, when you say you didn't see the twist coming, I need to ask if that was an intentional pun or not. No, because that wasn't a pun. I thought, well, I'm going to pantomime for the camera now. Is the twist? I thought you were saying that's no. the. Okay, because I would have been like, dude, that was genius. Oh my god. No. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, no. Uh, Land Fear with. Par it makes sense. Her motivations make sense. Perrin's vulnerability also makes sense. You know, what she's doing turns out to be terrifying and totally abhorrent. Um, but this is Lanfear, you know? This is uh, right. This is Mir and Sedai. This is... And, and I'm glad that we got it because she was built up to be such a villain and, and such an important antagonist from the beginning of this series that she needed to have some kind of big impact. I was still hoping series. that she would have a bigger impact. I honestly wanted to see armies of Shadow Spawn under Lanfear. I thought that was going to happen. <laughs> I thought it was going to be really cool. I thought that maybe she was going to have a showdown with Moraine and Nynaeve in the Pit of Doom while Ren has a showdown with Moradin. I thought, if you'd asked me what going into the uh, Memory of Light what was going to happen, I definitely thought that Lanfear was going to fight some other woman out of sheer jealousy over Rand. I mean, that would have been cool. It, like, it, it would have been nice to get, like, an Avienda Lanfear showdown. Yeah, like, a, yeah. A, a redux. Well, I mean, Avienda would have been and trussed up like a duckling and, and, and destroyed, though. I mean, like, so you have to give her somebody, like, on her... Nine even Moraine together. Nine even... 
in depends Avienda. on what kind of uh, uh, Angriel and Tur Angriel Avienda could have had in such a situation. I suppose, but then I wouldn't want Avienda to win with an Angriel. I would want it to be um, Moiraine and Nynaeve <laughs> against, like or sorry, sorry, Moiraine and Nynaeve. Sorry, uh, a Nynaeve and Avienda, both women who love Rand for separate reasons and who are very important mm. in his life. I will, and both causes for Lanfear to be supremely jealous. And of course, with Nynaeve's considerable strength matched yeah, with yeah, I mean, it that been. could have been good. It yeah. could have been good. Uh, but yeah, that's, yeah, that's the end of my parent stuff. Yeah, I'm just very disappointed that Lanfear, Lanfear's ending came the way it did. It was very anticlimactic. But I'm not going to spoil that, particularly spoil it yet. Um, let's see here. Yeah, just on to Rand then? Sure. Okay. Um, now. Okay, so to start with Rand, I have a lot about Rand. To contrast the epic ass-kicking scenes that he had in Towers of Midnight, from other points of view, other characters' points of view, now we're in Rand's head, and we're seeing a lot more vulnerability than I think I was expecting to see at this point, both internal and external. We can see that he hasn't quite gotten everything figured out yet. In the rare few yes. moments that he chooses to personally step into the last battle, the shadow responds in force. Balancing that transformation into the one true dragon is the face of the shadow making its strength known. And it's intimidating. It's very intimidating. I was, in some small part, really glad to see Rand turned back after he tries to prevent the loss of Tarwin's Gap. You know, as much as I wanted to watch Rand kick some trollic ass in his... I mean, let's be real. His scenes masquerading as other Ashaman like Jura Grady, that's really, really cool. But I was impatient for him to get his ass to Shale Ghoul. Any concerns that we have over the shadow are validated when we see Rand himself turned back by Mazum Taim. And so we head into the meat and potatoes of the last battle on shaky ground. And it was, I wrote down, unfortunately poignant. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with basically everything you just said. <laughs> I, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we, it's... Uh, sorry, go on. I was, I was going to continue though, but if you have anything you want to riff off on that one that's your chance I don't know I just I really liked um, how getting in Rand's head now versus in Towers of Midnight where he is Zen Rand he's Jesus Rand it's not what know, we expect Super Saiyan Rand whatever yeah. you want to call him um, he seems flawless now in Towers of Midnight and here we see that it, that's not quite the case yes he has come to an understanding of himself and he has achieved a certain amount of peace but there are still things Rand wrestles with. And that scene with Tam, uh, where they discuss the flame and the void, and, and ultimately Rand you know, says, like, yeah, I'll, I'll duel with you. Like, um, That's another step on the path for Rand, uh, where he's, he's still continuing to settle things within himself. Mm. It's, it, it wasn't the easy button getting clicked on top of Dragon Mount, the way it might have seemed when we weren't in his head for an entire book. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. On that scene with Tam, I did not like that scene. How about you? You didn't like that scene. Nope. I did not like that scene. I'll tell you why. It felt okay. fan servicey to me. It felt a little too gratuitous. It felt a little, a little unnecessary. I do like the idea of Tam Althor still having one final lesson for his son, or the idea of the Dragon Reborn still needing to learn one more thing from his father. I have no no opposition to that idea. I love the idea, but I don't like what it was, I guess. The subject of that lesson. I don't like how it was, oh, that hand is really holding you back. Which one? Oh, the one that you're not carrying. It, like, I, I don't know. I, the, the duel between the two is objectively really cool. I I just really wish it, that it had happened while Rand had two hands. I don't know why I had to wait until the last damn volume. <laughs> like, I wanted Tam, and I know Tam is, is, is fatherly and mature enough, and he loves his son enough to be proud of Rand, especially with his performance having been maimed. But I just wish Tam had got that opportunity to see Lord of Chaos Rand whooping ass against the five best <laughs> that he could find. Like, I'm just, I feel robbed out of that chance that, I don't know, to see Tam's reaction to Rand's true skill. And I get, I know it's it's immature, it's childish. It's probably the younger teenage part of me that's got a problem with that. But I just, oh man, I, 
Hmm. It's it on top of everything in the scene feeling a little too gratuitous. I just I didn't li- I walked away not liking the scene and, and wishing that it had been a little huh. different. Wow, well, yeah, I didn't have that reaction to yeah, it. Yeah, I all. didn't think you I could tell by your tone of voice that <laughs> you didn't think so. But hey, that's why we have the podcast, right? That's why we have the discussion. We're not going to agree on everything. In fact, it yeah. gets pretty boring, I think, if we agree on everything. Uh, that that is probably true. <laughs> <laughs> but I could hear some people furiously clacketing, clacking on their T keyboard right now, typing back to me, going, "What? You didn't like this? What is wrong with you?" <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, we learned a little more about Rand's abilities. He can sense a beetle on a leaf, half a league away or some such. I was like, whoa, that's cool. I wasn't expecting to get that info. The dragon awesome. is one with the land. And the land I know. And I love that it turned out to be literal. Ah, uh-huh. It wasn't metaphorical. I mean, in some small way it was. But for the most part, it turns out to be, no, legit, you didn't misread that. The, the land yeah. is one with a dragon. Let the prince of the morning sing so that the green things will grow and the valley give forth lambs or however the hell it goes. I love seeing that in action. Right, yeah. And he's seeing it from Rand's point of view this time, because we saw a lot of it in Towers of Midnight, but we didn't get his internal thought on the process, or, his, like, his limitations, for example. Because in that scene, he in that moment, he was thinking about how he has all these fantastical new abilities on top of the ones he already had to begin with, but he still doesn't mm-hmm. understand women. So. Yeah. I did like that. The, that juxtaposition between his, his abilities and his conflicts, internal and external. <laughs> I loved it. Um... Surreal to see his interactions with Moiraine again. I love their banter. How did you feel about their banter before yeah, I continue? What did uh, you think about that? I I thought that their conversations were mostly really good. Uh, I liked... I liked the honesty. Uh, you know, the... How each of them are willing to admit their mistakes toward each other. Yeah, uh, that felt very genuine for both of their characters. Um, Moiraine has always been a very self-aware person who learns from past mistakes, and Rand has become that kind of person. So, seeing them connect on that level was really, really nice. Oh yeah, yeah, and I, I, I love how they they switch, or I should say, how they weave together formality with familiarity. Because yep. she consistently recalls him, my lord dragon. And she, she has this very formal intonation with a lot of how she begins her, her sentences with him. But then there are these, these moments where she lets the mask of Aes Sedai fall. Sometimes she lets it fall entirely away. But still, again, still you get the sense that she's making this conscious and deliberate decision when to do so. And like yeah. I just I wrote down like I can't I've I've glowed so much about Moraine in the past. This woman is the epitome of elegance and class. Ugh, I I love Moraine. Her especially her analogy, <laughs> more like trying to guide a log through rapids. You know? <laughs> what an analogy! <laughs> I loved it. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, saying that she is just like the epitome of class and elegance. Like yeah yeah. I mean yeah. I love Moraine. I'm such a huge fanboy. Uh, and I... <clears throat> I cannot wait to see Rosam and Pike's take on this. Oh my god. Especially, like, the, oh. the scene. A knack when she walks into the tent. Oh my god. I'm gonna be there, sitting there. I'm probably gonna be 40 years old by the po- time I get to watch this scene. And I am going to be like Randall Thor in that scene. On my knees. In front of the television screen going, oh my god. Yeah, Roseanne Pike. Uh, is gonna, I can't wait to see her interpretation of that. She's gonna knock it out of the park. I hope so. I mm. I think she is the right actress for the role. Yeah, um, and I'm I'm excited. I mean, all the way back to our Eye of the World episode when I talked about like some of those scenes, uh, you know, with her in Camblin before the fireplace, like piecing together all of this information about the eye and. And how much I wanted to see Rosamund Pike yeah. perform that scene. You know, and, so many and, scenes. And of course, wait. you know, the the Manethrin story and things like that. It, it, but this is this is another point where I I truly hope we get to a memory of light in the show so that we can see her speaking with Rand. We can see her stepping into that tent at Marilor. Like 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. That that twinkle in her eye as she squeezes Perrin's elbow for a second, and how she she literally calls all of the rulers out on their own BS and say, "Look, this is all in the prophecy. You guys are completely missing this point." He calls on the the mountains to kneel and the seas to give way, and and it's just oh, watching her dominate that entire scene and. As an aside, the the interesting humor that I think is going to be offered in the character that was... God, what is his name? Oh my god, the ruler of Mirindi. Roadron. Roadron? Yeah, 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 yeah. Watching him... Who the hell is this woman? <laughs> Flick of air on yeah. the ear. It's going to be funny. Um, I, I will say, though, since we're still on Rand and Moiraine in, in one conversation, though, I didn't necessarily care for the whole joke of... I need some tea. Oh, yes, Moraine, said I. I mean, okay, it's it's a funny idea. But this goes back to our points previously, my point, I should say, previously, about objective humor versus subjective humor. If Rand uh-huh. had at any point in the series, as he himself points out, as if Brandon could excuse the joke not fitting by making the characters involved more self-aware, I guess, if he had at any point fetched tea for Moraine, it would have worked a little bit, a little more at least. As it is, though, the joke still doesn't make any sense. Maybe if it was mm-hmm. Matter Perrin, it would maybe it would have landed a bit better for me. Still wouldn't have made a total amount of sense. But uh, Rand would not even have anything resembling that reflex. Never. Yeah. I don't know. It just again, objective humor, funny. Subjectively speaking, with these two characters, doesn't make sense. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, we've we've certainly. Uh... Certainly yeah, we gone talked over about some of that. Humor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Um, and my last point about Rand, the imagery of those bloody footprints on the dark rock leading up to the heart of the mountain. That right there is your final season poster. Right there. Superb. It just begs. It begs to be seen. I love it. Ooh, yeah. That's that's good. That's good. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> so that's it. That rounds up all of my character discussion points. I still have a ass load of miscellaneous points and questions to get out of the way well just two questions including one lore segment from me so yeah oh i well let's go into lore right now okay um i i have a i have a couple of them okay uh first off there is a common a common uh complaint that i've seen in, in a sort of a philosophical question that pavara lies in a memory of light. Wait, wait, what point does she lie? So, she doesn't actually. Or at what point can she be interpreted as lying? Early on, it is in chapter four, uh, when she and, and like, Amarin and Dobser, you know, they're, they're, like, interrogating him and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and they wrap him up with flows of air. Yep. You know. I did just read that scene. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. So, Pavara loosens the weaves, preventing him from hearing them. And then, she gets asked, he cannot hear what we say? And she says no. Okay. But even can, though that's the argument, even though he can, yeah. But she doesn't know he can. Uh, well, she does. She's the one who loosened the weaves. Yeah, but, but did she know there's a flaw in her weaves? Oh, it loosened but, it. Sorry, looks like yeah, yeah. It's a double negative. So people people have complained about this many times online, but she doesn't lie because it's a double negative. He says he cannot hear what we say, and she says no. Saying no, he can hear oh. what we say. <laughs> yeah, okay, I get you. She okay, I thought you meant she made the entirety of a double negative, but she just completed a double negative. Exactly. Got exactly. you. Yeah, no, it makes sense. She could be she, she, yeah. like she technically in that moment was saying no, <laughs> like you're wrong, but she said it in such a way that it could obviously be. I love how the eyes that I find all these ways to to dance around the truth and to tie it into knots. It's so fun. Mm-hmm. That's cool. Yeah, I hadn't it, considered it, it that. It really is. The, I the wordplay, like this is one of the cleverer things um, when it comes to Robert Jordan's writing. Uh, it, it just 
how how much he twists meanings and words around yep. and this is brandon sanderson <clears throat> doing the same thing the and truth it's, it's just very very nice the truth that an um, Sedai speaks right am i right oh i love how oh, it's still, you are it's right. still still important 14 books later now mm. the second one okay just to get this out of the way rand oh. does not know the tinker's song Oh, okay. Um, that I didn't know that was still in question. Like, is that still a, a sentiment you've seen you've seen shared? Oh, all the time. All I mean, I time. don't spend as much time as you do on these forums, so I can imagine if it is, you would see it. But yeah, no. So, uh, <laughs> so like for for like on the one side, Brandon Sanderson has been asked to this, and he has outright said, "No, this is not the Tinker's song. The Tinker's song is not the song of growing. The Tinker's song is uh, like a myth. Basically, it's a song that would like." bring world peace if it were it's a ever symbol sung, like you know it's emb- it's an emblem of their yeah. of their people it's not actually yeah. something physical or it's tangible. a yeah sure it's a metaphysical ideal there um, you go. Like and it. on top of that it should be very clear i think it should be very clear that this is not the tinker's song given that the song that rand is singing matt hears the tune and matt recognizes it it's just like he's just singing like a random bar song you know? Wait, really? It's I the... thought that was. Hold on. I thought Matt was somewhat rec- like re- remembering it because there is something in his lineage that would recognize the tune if he heard it outright. It's... I didn't think Rand was legitimately yeah. just singing a folk song for an excuse to. Yeah, it's the intent behind it, is what makes the growing happen. Really? <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> but that's not what the ogier do, is it? Well, the Ogier the are not humans. The, the Ogier the are Nim. their own thing. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, I yeah. assume that they're <laughs> since they're all involved with the Dashain Aiel back in the Age of Legends in the Growing. The but song they're not growing. all singing the same song. If you no, go back not. to the uh, the flashback sequences in in the Shadow Rising, yeah, like they're they're singing like all complementary things. They're not all singing the same song. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Huh. I still thought uh, it was Matt, just like some part of his genetic code, rem- like picking up on the outsides of a tune that it hadn't heard in thousands of years. I didn't think it was legitimately just a folk song that Rand was using as an excuse to sing something. That's awesome. Yeah, no, doesn't Matt it's funny. It like a name? Matt, Matt, like yeah, oh well, yeah, but an actual song. That's why name. I thought it was Matt recognizing it instead of yeah. I I didn't think it was actually going to be what yeah, is it? Two yeah. maidens or something at dawn or whatever. The f- uh, I don't remember the exact name of it, but it was something like that. <laughs> um, but yeah, my my final lore point, though, and this ties all the way back to our Eye of the World episodes. Oh, The wow. voice. Oh, I figured this was coming. Yeah, how did I not know this was coming? Good point, though. It's, I'm glad that you are bringing it up, because I have also had to argue this online. Take it away. So, so we see... Very specific circumstances in which voices speak in all caps. We have the Dark One, and then we have the voice at the end of Eye of the World, and the voice in A Memory of Light here, when Rand yeah. is about to head into the Pit yeah. of Doom. And Rand going, Ravine! Sorry, that was just a joke. Continue. Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, now, we know from from things... The author has said that the voice in A Memory of Light is the same as the voice at the end of Eye of the World. Now, there are some arguments here. We talked about, you know, at in the Eye of the World, how um, if the creator is truly neutral, how can the creator be telling Rand, hey, it's not here? Sure. You know, how can, how can the creator be doing this? And also... You know, there's the flip side of that where I will take no part. You know? Yep. However, in my opinion, there's one piece of evidence that makes it absolutely impossible for this to be the Dark One, and it must then be the Creator. Here. And that is the very simple fact that Rand has the Artham Dagger on him. Rand, when this voice speaks to him, he is hidden from the sight of the Dark One. The Dark One has no idea he is there. They tested the dagger already earlier in the book, 
And the first time the Dark One shows awareness of Rand is when he steps into the Pit of Doom. And Rand feels that awareness upon him. And he's like, yep, the dagger worked. Yeah, but wasn't he in the Pit of Doom already when he heard that voice? No. I thought he was in the passage and it was like the the no. stalactites were, were dropping. And then, because surely the Dark One knows, wants Rand to continue once he's in there. Because there's a point where Rand stops and he says, I am not approaching you on my knees, Shaitan. And like, and I think the description that of that is, scene is after. like a machine grinding to a halt. He needs to be forced through and the Dark One relents. That's after, eh? Like, I'm oh, sorry, I thought it was after. in the same scene, though. This is them right. at, no, this is at the very end of the chapter when Rand steps forward into the realm. He says, thank you to the voice. And does then steps voice, forward into the Dark One's realm, leaving footprints of blood behind. Yeah, but you're talking about a it difference is only... of, like, inches here. Like, maybe the Dark One had just noticed him there or something. No, I, no, I no, no, no. Because the next time we get to Rand, as he steps into the Pit of Doom, he then feels, feels the, the Dark surprise. One's awareness, and he goes, the dagger worked. Okay. Yeah, fair. That's fair. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. If I, is, as, as soon as you mentioned the Dark yeah. One's surprise after he stepped into, you, you're absolutely right. I remember that now. Yeah. It cannot be the Dark One's voice. Mm. Okay. So... All right, now on to my bit of lore for today. I never do this. All right. I, I All right. never do this. But there I'm was excited. something that happened in this part of the series, in this part of this book of this series, that links way, way, way back to a point that I raised during, I'm sure it was during my miscellaneous points as well, um, in an episode that we had on the fires of heaven. So we're talking like six or seven months back now that in our recordings Ooh. at this point. Yeah, I, I said, don't remember. <laughs> at that point, I would be returning to this here precisely when we got to it. And now we've arrived. So there's this moment in the tent at the Field of Marilor where Perrin overhears Rand whisper something. And that something precisely is, and I quoted, Your dream now. When you wake from this life, we will be no more. Now. I had, during my first few read-throughs, been confused about this line. And at the time, I chalked it up to another of Rand's kind of absent-minded muttering, as we saw him doing, I think it was in Knife of Dreams, when he's muttering along with Luz Theron, something along the lines of, They cursed by our name, and here we are, again and again. And I, I didn't stop to think about, first off, Luz Theron no longer being a voice in Rand's head at this point. Right. Or in this case, that there would be nobody he could be sensibly addressing in such a manner. But on our read-through of The Fires of Heaven, six or seven months ago, I found a line that rang very, very similar, which I brought up at that point, and it was Avienda, telling Rand, there are some that say the Aiel are your dream now, and that when you wake from this life, we will be no more. Now, I've, I paraphrased that a little bit, but I'm sure it's at least 90% accurate word for word. Yeah, My point no. is... This is what Rand was referencing. Nine books in almost 20 publishing years later, he was in that moment in the tent at the Field of Marilor after hearing Avienda demand that the Aiel be included in the Dragon's Peace. And despite the, the mounting tension, the disorder around him, everything falling apart, reminiscing on something Avienda told him years past, contemplating the end of the Aiel. What a callback that was. I love it. That is it. an awesome pickup that is an Thanks. awesome pickup i didn't even think of that no no i, I, <laughs> I didn't I, want to go I, too much into detail in the fires of heaven because i was gonna have to talk about spoilers for a memory of life yeah yeah in the dragon's piece yeah, and the i'll be included i i mean i i always uh you know kind of considered that um that that saying from avienda you know vacuum not not connecting it to this scene at all but yep. that's a great, great pickup. As soon as she adds the Aiel to that dragon's piece, he realizes the end of the Aiel, or at least what he knows as the Aiel. And that's him making that connection. Oh my god, this is how I destroy the Aiel. Yeah. Nice. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Now, I have two questions for you before I go into my all of my just stupid, inane, immature, noticeable uh, reactions. Miscellaneous points? Yeah, okay. yeah. But my questions are as follows. Number one, Lanfear. Why the heck is she looking upward when the Dark One's attention apparently falls on her in Teleron Riyadh? 
I mean, technically, he's not even any closer, he being the Dark One, is not even any closer to the boar than he is to the rest of the world. But Lanfear definitely seems to think he is gazing at her from the sky for some reason. I don't get it. I mean, it could be accomplished by simply having her gasp and widen her eyes as if she feels something weird and then disappears. Why look up to the sky? Yeah, I don't have an answer for that. I have been puzzled by that as well every time I've read this book. Um, I, I have a possible there, solution? Like, yeah, the only thing I could ever think of was that it's just like when she feels his attention growing, it feels like it's coming from above. But it also doesn't really make a whole lot of sense that she would be doing that because she knows how the world of dreams Yeah, works. she's the one that opened like, the door in the first place. Yeah. She like, knows exactly, it, like, metaphysically speaking, that he is not in the sky. He is everywhere right. and nowhere. Nobody knows that so, more than she does. I not might even ran. just chalk that up to, like, an authorial hiccup. I have a, I have a possible but, explana explanation. Okay. We see when Rand is outside of the power... Outside of the pattern, not the power. When he's outside of the pattern in the Dark One's realm, for lack of a better term, and he is observing the world, he seems to do so from on high. He seems to do so from above. In fact, the world itself is definitely described as a ball hanging in front of them in some parts, I think. But definitely yep, from above, yeah, because on his palm, the rest of the world, on the world, a continent, on the continent, the battlefield, and on the battlefield, two men. Like, it, that definitely gives you a sense of looking at things from above. Metaphysically mm -hmm. speaking, he is not above them. But I can see that being, A, a quirk of the world of dreams, or B, just a quirk of the pattern itself, needing to symbolize a direction for the Dark One's attention. Uh, that, that makes sense. I mean... Kind of. Sure. Sure. I could okay. accept that. Thank you. Um, anybody else has any ideas, though? Definitely let us know in the comments. Um, number two. Is there anything special about Moradin's blade? Because Min had that viewing about Kalindor being wielded against a sword of black. Now, I thought at the time, surely that is oh. symbolic, because Kalindor yeah. was used against Rand, for lack of a better term. And we don't get a description of Moradin's blade either, right? But no, there's, there's nothing special about it. It's kay. just a sword. But then I yeah. thought, I did have a thought. I thought to myself, then again, Ishamayel did have a staff. Not a sword, obviously, but a staff. And that staff was obviously supernatural in some way because it left a wound that is currently bleeding onto the rocks as they speak. So I, mean, I, like, I ended it, up asking... It was Diz probably just Thakandar forged. You know, okay, like yeah. Not... Like, that was my ultimate question. Does Ishamayel have his own prophesied weapon or at least a unique one no. of some sort? No. It, it's There's nothing like... Yeah, it's not like a shadow calendar or you know some... Oh, I didn't think it was anything like Shadow's anything. version no, of Kalindor or anything, but I thought it might have been about like that. something, some weapon that he needs to wound the dragon permanently. Something like, even almost like a Turangriel, in a, but made from the... Oh, wouldn't that be fascinating? Turangriel from the True Power. Ooh. Uh, that's, that's a story for another time. Is it now? Oh, I just... A, <laughs> a, really, a really funny story from an old uh, Wheel of Time 4th Age role-playing okay. game that included well, a... Uh, a, a true power to Ron Grail. Oh, but, really? To wow. answer your question, no. The, okay. There's nothing in prophecy about okay. him wielding a sword. Oh. To, no. It was a fun thought to entertain while it, while it lasted. Um, yeah. So I guess, I, now that we're, should I just dive into my miscellaneous thoughts here? I've got, oh sure. God, I've got quite a few of them. I loved a little bit, little bit of wisdom from Bear to Avienda in, in terms mm -hmm. of changing one of her children's names. Such a small change, but very meaningful. I loved it. It was awesome. I love Bear. I mean, She's got her drawbacks, but she's pretty damn cool in, in her own way. Um, see here. Oh, yeah, Maureen's entrance at Marilor. Can't wait to see Roseanne and Pike. Um, oh, uh, Brandon's use of Aiel humor. Uh, I, I'm thinking, of course, of the moment where Perrin explains to Gaul in the World of Dreams some of the dangers involved, saying that here you could simply be just tied up and have your throat cut if you're not careful. And Gaul just responds by laughing. A deep, mm -hmm. just belly, bellyful, guffawing laughter. I love it. It's just, it's so typical, not just typical gall, but so emblematic of, uh, or symbolic, I should say, of the Aiel humor. <laughs> it was cool. The, the thought of him laughing at the idea of himself having his throat cut uselessly. Right, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I th that was good. Um, uh, and Andral and the gateways, I already talked about that. 
Um, oh, ooh, uh, dyslexia. So we've been discussing characters like Dark Rand and characters like Perrin. These characters that Sanderson has this apparent ease or familiarity with writing from these perspectives. But one that we haven't had a chance to talk about until now is Loyal, son of Erin, son of Halan. A silence yeah. like screaming. I find Sanderson's take on Loyal to be nothing short of brilliant. I, I, honestly, I think unquestionably better even than Jordan's version of Loyal. So I want to get your thoughts on that. I, I'm i pretty meh on Loyal. <gasps> really? Um, yeah. I Some aspects of that scene uh, make me cringe. Ooh. Well, I didn't actually like, read the scene back to front for this read, so maybe I would have had a couple things to point out. I don't know. Is there anything in particular uh, that comes to mind? Because I might just agree immediately. I gotta, I gotta pull up the exact quote because I'm pretty sure I know the wording, but I, I need to just make sure. Um, if you know someone similar, wording, first, I'm not gonna be able to finish the quote. Yeah, for it's you the either. very first line of the chapter. Um, it's yeah. Loyal son of Arendt, son of Halan, had secretly always wanted to be hasty. You don't like, like that so, line? No, because A, we already know Loyal's personality. It's it's presented as this, like, grand revelation of him, like, admitting to him. It's like, he's already admitted this to himself Yeah, but this is ago. our first we, viewpoint. No, we had loyal viewpoints in Knife of Dreams. Did we? With Arith's... Oh, Arith's yeah, wedding. up axes and clear the field. Yeah, yeah, no, I forgot like, about that. It, 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 this line is there as if it's some like, oh, oh my gosh, oh, and, I, no, and it's I don't agree nothing with that. special or new about it. At I don't all. think that, that's that, that was line the purpose makes me of that cringe line. every time. I don't like, think that was the purpose of that line. I think it's to show Loyal's it's, thought it's, process that we entered his scene on because he was already considering humans and their struggle against the shadow and how they live such short lives and yet they're so willing to throw their lives away. For the, for the greater good. But it's he was considering humans in we that moment. We already know it. We yeah, already I know. know he I thinks know, but this I way. think, I think like, it makes sense where <laughs> Loyal's mindset was in that moment. If he was thinking about something completely I, I unrelated, I would have probably be agreeing with you right now. But he was already contemplating the difference between humans and Ogier and the impetuousness of the latter. Or the former, I should say. I disagree. I, I love I, it. I, I love it. it was, I'm going to disagree with, oh. you, with, with your disagreeing. Ugh. That was that was one of those lines that was just like cringy. That was one of Brandon our um, Sanderson. memories of light that we got released in in the the weeks leading up to well the release. Yes. I love mm. that line. I had secretly always oh. wanted to be hasty. I was like, oh, that fits. I like that. Okay, it's just loyal being a young kid. No, I didn't like it. <laughs> okay, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna sway you on this one. Ah, uh, let's see here, my bit of lore. I'm going to bitch a little bit about Malkir. Okay? Okay. I love Lan. Let it not be said that I don't love Lan. I'll Lan Mandragoran. And I love his story. I am invested in his story. I don't, however, love wasting my time as a reader while the last freaking battle rages on. And for me, Lan's impromptu, let's return home to Malkir. Like, and... Two chapters later, or however long later, well, I didn't last long, let's retreat and abandon it again, had me grinding my teeth a little bit. Because at no point during any of these 13 books previously had we been given anything even remotely resembling a reason to care about any other Malkiri, or the country itself, for that matter. It's, it's, it's not so much what happened that bugs me as it is the manner in which it was presented, as if... This is a huge loss for everyone. Like, oh no! The corrupted land of infested lakes and blighted plants has, after only a few hours of being reclaimed, for the reader at least, suddenly been lost again. And now we're supposed to deeply care about it. I didn't care about it. I found it to be such a triviality that it slightly bothers me every time we get around to it. So I'll give you a chance to, rest to retort. Malkir. No, like, I... I mostly agree with you there. Like, to an extent, I can understand the thought process, like, you know, on, on Lance's side there. But, like, it's... Eh. Yeah, we've got momentum. Eh. Let's see how far we can... How, how far into it we can dig. It makes sense. Yeah, but, but, but at, you know, like, at the same time, it's like... It's not like Land to just completely disregard the bigger picture. You know this is, a, you know, a short one victory. 
Like that, that yeah. this is not going to stay. Like yeah. if, if you're going to reclaim, truly reclaim Malkir, it's going to be after the last battle. Yeah. Like, yeah, that, that's it. That's a, that's a damn Dark good way of putting it. The like, fact that he tried to so. reclaim Malkir in the middle of the last battle, i.e., or, or, no, i.e., but the start of the last battle for like what is considered even the start, depending on where you want to draw these arbitrary lines, he just up and randomly decides this is the time to retake Malkir, and of course yeah. he loses it again. And I'm just left feeling like, well, that was a gigantic waste of time. Yeah, it's like it's a not like Lan to just to be completely irrational especially when so much of his life has been spent like yeah you know if he had taken it back not permanently, acting like that i mean yeah yeah so or if he had lost it permanently like that would have been much more sad of course of course then again it would be the death of land mandragor and that's what i was expecting if there's anybody in the last battle who i thought was guaranteed to die more so than rand it was land mandragor um so, I don't know. I just don't like that it was... It even, like... Again, it's not the subject. It's not what happened. It's how close together. Just, I'm gonna do this. And then, within a few pages, ah, crap, that didn't work. I just... Yeah. It felt like a waste of time. Um, yeah. Let's see here. I loved the chapter, Older, More Weathered. This is definitely a top three scene for me in this book. Maybe top five. I don't know. We'll, we'll get... It'll be my list of favorite scenes for sure. If not in the top three, as an honorable mention. The manner in which Matt immediately misreads that situation. You know, Rand, Rand, here now, let's be calm about this. Let's not do anything we're going to regret. Rand is just smiling pleasantly. He's clearly guessed Matt's misinterpretation, but he's just having fun with it. He's like, hello, Matt. Mm -hmm. I just, I cackle at that line every time. Yeah, so a large part of that chapter I really enjoy. Mm. The whole, like, one-upsmanship competition. I hate that. Mm, I, I figured you would. So dumb, and it's so not in character for either of them. And more importantly than that, even if you're going to accept that at face value, Matt wins that because he's like, "Well, I rescued Moiraine," and he yeah. gets the last word. It's like, I'm sorry, rescuing Moiraine is not a more impressive feat than cleansing Saidin. Like, yeah. come but on. I think that's why, <laughs> arguably, not to say that I I disagree with what you're saying. I actually agree a lot with what you're saying. But I think it could be argued from the other side that, well, yeah, that's why Rand is laughing. Because Matt would think something so trivial in comparison would match cleansing the source, you know? I yeah, think that's why I, Rand I mean, I don't know, because, laughing. like, because it's the way it's set up, like, yeah, where Matt yeah. does keep, Again, like, escalating it. I'm going to keep hammering this damn point into the ground. <laughs> Objective humor versus subjective humor. Objectively yeah. hilarious. I think it's funny subjectively though i think it does not work and it just leaves a bad taste in my mouth it's like it it's like mixing peanut butter and mustard separately funny Ugh. together they don't belong together they don't they really don't so there we go uh let's see here right. lan another another point about lan why do we mourn this this scene right here and the scene where rand is is helped to or helped prepare to face the Amerlin way back in the Great Hunt. Might be my all-time favorite land scene. One of those two. Um, facing down the two Murdral is a big contender, too, but I think this might be it. Why do yep. we mourn? I love it. Oh, it's so good. Telling the stories of the Fallen and the crazy stuff they've seen. <laughs> so cool. The arrival of Demon Dread. Drew, if yeah. you recall, my man, on the day that A Memory of Light was released, I was still currently at work that day. I had to work that morning, actually, from open till 5 p.m. I was working at uh, Staples uh, Business Center. 
I used to be a laptop sales guy, well, just tech sales. And at one point, while I was tapping my foot impatiently to get my ass home so I could read this book that I've been waiting for since I was 10, I received three words in a text from Drew McCaffrey, ladies and gentlemen. And those three words, as he was reading it and I wasn't, were, oh, hello, Demon Dread. You asshole. You genius. That's but you asshole. two words, but yeah. Well, you said, oh. <laughs> You said, oh, hello, Demon Dread. Oh, I think you put oh, hello. Oh, okay. I th I'm pretty sure you said, oh, but it might have just been two that, words. It might that have could just be. Been, that could be. Hello, Demon Dread. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I remember in that moment, I stomped my foot in the aisle. I went, <laughs> <laughs> you genius. Oh, I love being man. teased like that. I, don't get me wrong. This is not me berating you. I love being teased like that. But <laughs> that was good. That was a good one. That was very good. Um, oh, oh uh, yes. my second last. Oh, yes. Oh, wait, no, my third last, because I have two more, two more after this. The monumental disappointment that was named Shidar Haran. Yeah. You want to address that at all, or should I just tear into it? I mean, I don't so really have much I, else to say. When I first read this book, I was very disappointed. I wanted an epic yes. Shidar Haran battle. Uh, but at the same time... Like Where would in, it have in fit? retrospect, after you know, it it doesn't make sense. Why would Rand battle the Dark One as Shadow Haran and battle the Dark One in the Boar? Like, see, it, it let just me tell you how my brain going into it thought that was going to work out. Like, this is this isn't like a Final Fantasy, you know, JRPG battle where the like you fight bosses in stages. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I don't yeah, know. no, what I thought was going to happen. And this, this represents a monumental amount of disappointment on both sides of this coin. I thought Shidar Haran and Pod and Fane were going to take each other out. That's what I thought was going to happen. But no. No, no, uh, no. This, so, that was so, so not what happened. No, it's not. It uh, cannot we'll, be farther. We'll talk much more about Pod and Fane later in, in, yeah. in our third episode. Yeah. But I was but, yeah. so disappointed with Shidar Haran there. I was like, I'm still disappointed. I still wanted there to be some big, sh like you said, some big epic, uh, ep epic showdown between Shidar Haran and maybe not just with Rand, but with with somebody who is on his level. And I thought, well, the only truly terrifying, powerful, and mysterious outlier to be accounted for in this equation had to be Pod and Fane. So I thought that's where that was mm -hmm. going, but nope, nope. Moving on. Rodel Iteralda. I have a quote here. The only quote of oh, the second second quote that I have for this episode here. But I love this line. I giggled out loud when I came to it for the first time. And I'm going to probably giggle at the end of this one. He'd set them still fighting when that time came. For now, however, he'd sent them to cut down enormous thorn bushes. They'd place these across the pass, lashed together in masses 20 feet thick and 8 tall. The thorn bales had been relatively easy to place, far lighter than stones or dirt, yet amassed as they were, the Trollocs couldn't move them by simply pushing. The first ranks ran up against them and tied, or in tried, but were rewarded with five-inch thorns biting into them. The creatures in the rear pressed forward, causing the front ranks to turn in anger and rise up against those behind. This left the bulk of the Trolloc forces frozen in the pass, at his mercy. He didn't have much mercy for Shadow Spawn. Oh man, that line, I love it. That simple, it's really almost good. monosyllabic, simple hammer of a line. Well, he didn't have much mercy for Shadow Spawn. I love it. It's so good. That is, that has Sanderson's fingerprints all over it. So, I have a quote. No, okay. My only quote, and this is, in my opinion. The best line, the best bit of dialogue Brandon wrote for the Wheel of Time. Oh, wow. Across and, all three books. And this is, and I, I'm saving this kind of style discussion thing for now because I, I want us to kind of discuss a little bit. This is in the prologue. Okay. It is when it's from Mogedian's point of view during the Forsaken Social. And Moradin says, The last days are upon us. In these hours... You will earn your final rewards. If you have grudges, put them behind you. If you have plots, bring them to completion. 
Make your final plays for this. This is the end. I was on the train. And Brandon my had friend. the... Brandon had the audacity to not make that the final line of the prologue. There's another Tom scene afterward. Yeah. It kills me. That is the perfect line to end the prologue of A Memory of Light on. And Brandon wrote another Tom scene after it. There was no need for this Tom scene to end it. Like, oh. Yeah, I think it would have oh, worked just better. So just freaking good. Far better if he had included Talmanis' final scene. The, the impact of the ground was like water or something like that. If that had been preceding this instead of succeeding this scene, yeah, I absolutely. That, for this, this is the end. Picture me halfway to Toronto at this point on a rattling train in, you know, in, in a compartment there and just like seeing that lying there and realizing and just having these goosebumps like oh my god i am reading the last volume of the wheel of time i was on the train and i remember that specific specific moment i'll never forget yep. it. i will never forget yeah it, it. was and my last it was incredible yeah my last miscellaneous point here i want to apologize to you drew not for something i did but after oh. something i i read and that was oh dear serene being taken under Grandel's compulsion. I know you're a big fan of Serene, so I just wanted I to do say, like Serene. Rest in the light, Serene. I will drink to that. Yeah, I liked her. Um, so she's yeah, not, I was sad for you when I saw that. Yeah, she's not my favorite white. I didn't uh, know. Sien yeah. is my favorite white, but oh, but I did it. like Serene. Damn it! I did confuse her with Sien. I thought I wasn't. I was. I was making sure. Very, very consciously sure not to uh, not to um, uh, mix her up with Sayerin. Yeah, I hadn't considered yeah. Sien or oh, Sierin. <laughs> yeah, oh god, don't even. Start yeah, so it. <laughs> so there's there's Serene, Sayerin, Sierin, and Sien. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he loves. So we got his we got a, a gray, a gray who was basically a red. Uh, two whites and a brown. <laughs> I don't even understand how you keep track of these. Oh my goodness. Um, yeah, that's it. That's the rest. That is all of my points for discussion uh, uh, about the first, I don't say the first third, but more than the first half of A Memory of Life. Oh my gosh, yeah. <laughs> all right, so I think that takes us into the final draft then, doesn't it? I just, I mean, I have some closing thoughts, but it's not about the book so much um, as it oh, is just okay. about the process of this reading. So I wasn't able to find my e-reader for this read-through. And if I'm being honest, it's actually been lost, I think, since the Shadow Rising, I want to say. So I <laughs> I don't know where it is. So I've been subsisting on falling asleep and listening to the audiobooks or simply just reading the summaries online. Because I have excellent recollection of these books. I've read them so many times. But I'm often sifting for interesting points of discussion. Not the things that immediately jump out to me, but the things that can be picked, uh, that can be drawn from the text. And there's something that's been bothering me. A tiny bit, not a large amount, because it's taking me 14, well, more than 14 episodes. It's taking me like 30 episodes to bring it up. But it's been bothering me for almost a year now. And as we've been doing our Wheel of Time read throughs. Sorry, go ahead. You say something? No, you. sorry, you're just like, uh, your connection was breaking up there. Oh, really? Damn. Uh, did you get the sentiment, okay, though? Something think, that's been I think pissing you're caught me up off. now. Yeah, there's something that's been pissing me off that I've been having to deal with up until this point when I'm doing my read-throughs. When you type any Wheel of Time book title into Google, followed by the words chapter summaries, the first result you get is always, at least in my case, always, always library.tarvalon.net. Now, in yes. terms of volume of information, it's succinct. It's not overly long. It's not too short. But in terms of accuracy and especially grammar for some reason it's absolutely abysmal just listen i wrote down this <laughs> snippet copied word for word about what it had to say on a portion of chapter five for this book okay i wrote down oh word for word rand welcomes them and tells them they need a plan to fight the shadow as well as that he won't die so the humanity could continue fighting each other the dragon requires their things as payment for his life they're spelled t-h-e-r-e the borders to be set as oh, they man. are at the moments, which means prohibition countries to attack each other. 
That is the <laughs> first Google result for a memory of light chapter summaries. In chapter five, you will read that. So that pissed me off. Oh, Sorry, yikes. I've been dealing with that for about 30 episodes now. Or if I can't get to the like the required reading, I just ch- read summaries. I go to this point and it's just it's just I want to take a red marker. I want to take a red bazooka and just spray paint the entire screen and like, "Oh my god, how is this I, I don't want to These are the this is tarvalon.net library.tarvalon.net Oh man. It's abysmal. Now, I do want to say though. I do want to say I want to let it be known that if this is somebody's like second language, which I'm starting to suspect, I have the utmost respect for that. My my own second language, French, because I'm Canadian. My second language is French. Despite the fact that I took it all the way through 12th grade, and my mom herself is a French teacher who speaks to me occasionally in French, when she doesn't want my siblings to understand, my, my French is not as good as this individual's English, if this is somebody who doesn't natu- natively speak it. However, that said, you are not going to catch me anytime soon writing chapter summaries in French about French literature. Particularly once I realized yeah. that my page was the yeah. first return as a basic Google search, I would, at that point I would probably want somebody to like proofread it. So yeah, that's that's, that's, that's me being yikes. an old uh, uh, pretentious curmudgeon for now. Yeah, and that's it. That's it for me. I'm ready. To, <laughs> I'm ready to go into the final draft. Okay, so then on that note, I really want to uh, drink a little bit of beer. So let's go into the final draft. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I'm gonna start mine because mine's the uh, mine's the boring choice. Once again, I'm abstaining from drinking alcohol. It's been three weeks, four weeks since I had my last drop of liquor. Yeah, it's it's been a while. Yeah. So what I brought to the table today is just straight up Fanta. That's legit what I've been oh. drinking. I've been drinking Fanta, and I love Fanta. I'm normally used to the taste of vodka accompanying it. It's actually surprisingly delicious without any traces of alcohol in it. But, uh, you know, <laughs> still doesn't replace my whiskey, mm. unfortunately. But Fanta, as far as, like, a soda goes, worthy substitute. It's not too bad. I like It was refreshing. And that last sip that I had was to Serene being taken by Grandel's Compulsion. So I've been drinking Fanta. Cool, refreshing yeah. Fanta. Very nice. Well, I have been drinking a hazy India Pale Ale from Weldworks Brewing Company in uh, Greeley, Colorado. I've Ooh. featured Weldworks on the podcast a you couple of times, have. I think. Yeah. Um, uh, but yes, this is a, a hazy IPA uh, brewed with Nelson Savan Mosaic and Lotus hops. Um, it's definitely got a, a pretty bright, fruity character to it, mm. which you would expect with the, especially the Mosaic hops there. Um, it's really tasty. It's not like, you know, I've, I've said in the past IPAs, especially hazy IPAs, aren't like my favorite style of beer but i like them on occasion and this was a good occasion and this is uh specifically uh evocative of the first i don't know maybe dozen chapters of this book it is called a series of straightforward propositions <laughs> are you serious hold on let me pull the yeah. webcam i want to see this bottle a series of straightforward propositions i'm gonna screen cap that oh hold it up again oh, no, i missed it uh, there it is okay Got her. <laughs> Nicely done. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was I was kind of like, you know, with, with the, the quarantine and everything, I'm not exactly going out and perusing the shelves and liquor stores and stuff. Sure. And, and reading this this week, I was like, man, what am I going to, what, what beer am I going to bring in? I don't have a beer and that I, I've been sitting on for a year and a half for this episode. <laughs> I, uh, at early in the quarantine, my wife and I were very bored and we went and made a spreadsheet and cataloged every beer we have in our, in our house. <laughs> That's one of the most adorably dorky things I love about you guys. Yeah. And, uh, but it worked out because I basically just went to the spreadsheet. And I was like, Oh, let me just cruise through here and see if yeah, there yeah. are any beers that, that work for it. And, and I noticed that I was like, Oh, that's perfect. You know, we got, we got the, uh, you know, the forsaken social where Morden's just straightforward telling them like, look, Game's over. Yep. It's time Time's to up. Down to business. And then we got, you know, the, the dragon's piece where Rand's like, here, this is how it's going to be. This is my proposition. And then a very literal straightforward proposition where Avieta shows up in his tent and she's like, oh, okay. oh by the way, we're, yeah, like, <laughs> yeah, we're, 
right now. You, you, you may... will you will bed me. Like <laughs> Yes. Enough talking. You will bed me now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so yeah, I thought that was a, a, a nice one to bring in. Yeah. I, I once again though, I'll tell you, I don't know what beer I'm gonna bring in next week. I do know what I'm gonna bring in for the final episode, and I am so excited for that. Nice. But, uh, Very nice. Oh, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the time stamps for this episode, and it hasn't run as long as I thought it was going to, considering we had to read, what, 661 pages, did you say it was? 616, I think. Oh, wow. Yeah. Still a lot of, a lot of goddamn... Re- I thought this was going to be a three-hour episode. I thought so. But it looks like we're making some good time. That's what happens when there's only well, two of us. Our time and I did better. manage to do the entire synopsis in four minutes instead Somehow, of like 15. I don't understand how you mentioned that. That was, a, that was like superhuman, Drew. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, I think that takes us to the end of episode 63 of the Indie Deadline podcast. Next up, we are covering chapter 37, The Last Battle. Just that chapter. So, yep. buckle up. Uh... If you want to get early access to that, check us out on Patreon, patreon.com slash inkingoutloud. Uh, in addition to early access to our weekly episodes, you can get our monthly short fiction uh, written by Rob or myself. You can get access to our monthly uh, short episodes on short stories, novellas, general fantasy topics. Um, we have a monthly newsletter, stuff like that. Uh, yeah, all of those proceeds go toward uh, Pat, our sound engineer, and Danny, our artist. So, yeah, check us out there, patreon.com slash inkingoutloud. As always, I'm your host, Drew McCaffrey, and with me is my co-host, Rob Santos. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you next time. Goodbye, everyone.